Good afternoon, everybody. This is Chris Osborne with First Indiana Robotics, and we are excited to be bringing you some more uh, first virtual uh, content today on Thursday, May 7th. Today, we've got uh, a drive coach panel uh, that we'll be starting off with, uh, that we'll be introducing those folks here just in a few minutes. Uh, then uh, after that conversation, we're going to be hearing from some of our student board members uh, on Team 461 talking about STEM inclusion. Then at 5.30, we're gonna be hearing from another student board member uh, about programming uh, and how to go from hero to zero or rookie to pro grammar uh, to uh, kind of talk about that, uh, that time from uh, where you don't know a whole lot about programming and, and kind of getting into and becoming more of a veteran. And finally, we're gonna wrap our, uh, our show up today uh, the last hour from six to seven, having a, a panel conversation around advocacy. So what is legislative advocacy? Uh, how do you get started with it? Uh, that's gonna be led uh, by our one of our student board members, uh, Devin. Uh, she's gonna be talking with uh, Steve Heyer, who's from team uh, 27, Team Rush up in Michigan, but he also helps run NAC, the National Advocacy Conference. Then Frank Ferrari, who's on the NAC conference staff, uh, Veronica Schlipp, who's with Barnes and Thornburg, uh, Ben Grove, who's with Thompson Coburn. They're the, um, a firm that works with FIRST. Uh, and then Carolyn Arthurs, who's with FIRST uh, to talk about advocacy. So that's our program for today. And uh, thank you for joining us here on our Twitch channel. Again, uh, if you've got any questions as we go, uh, please feel free to uh, put them into our Twitch chat. And we'll try to get uh, those questions over to um, our speakers or presenters. So without further ado, let's introduce our first group. Um, it is a group of veteran uh, mentor drive coaches. Uh, we've got Danny Blau from Team 6956. Uh, Danny, you want to come on in and join the group? Uh, we have Joy Doing, Dr. Joy Doing from Team 45, one of the, our, our original and sustaining teams at Kokomo, Indiana. Uh, Liz Smith, who uh, works for Andy Mark, but is also a, a mentor and drive coach for Team 3940 Cyber Tooth. Uh, and Lenny De La Cruz. Len Lenny, thank you. Thank you, Lenny, from Team 1018. And Tom Walker, uh, a mentor uh, from several different teams. Uh, Tom's been around for a while. Um, and but most recently, Tom works with uh, Team 3947, uh, the Last Crusaders from Knightstown High School. Uh, they uh, they are, I think, besides university, they may be our smallest high school that competes in FRC in Indiana. Um, so I believe it. Yeah, but they do a great job, and you wouldn't know it, <laughs> and you wouldn't know it. Uh, I think you guys were winners of our Plainfield District event in 2018. Yes. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah, it doesn't matter how small a school you are. You guys still can bring home the blue banner. So, uh, so welcome all of you uh, to our conversation today. Um, if you wouldn't mind, let's maybe just start off. I know I just kind of introduced you, but if you wouldn't mind, maybe just um, going around and um, telling us a little bit about your experience in first. Um, so I'll just kind of point at your or talk to you. So Danny, tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, Kind of how you came through first, or I, not all of us have, uh, not all of us are alum, uh, but some of us on the call are. So, Danny. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I got my start uh, actually in first Lego League, um, and then I was on a, a first robotics competition team for four years, where um, I got the privilege of being a driver for two years. And so, I think in the context of this conversation today, that experience being a driver on a team really helps sort of inform a lot of the things that I do now um, as a drive coach. Um, and so uh, I got, uh, after high school, I mentored teams, you know, throughout college, um, you know, and, and did a lot of, you know, cool, fun stuff that there. Um, I got my degree in aerospace engineering. Um, and then uh, I now work at Andy Mark, so I get to play robots like all day long and it's super awesome. 
Um, and I, I've worked with uh, a couple teams here in Indiana um, where I've got to be a drive coach for uh, a while. And I've had the privilege to work with the other panelists, you know, here. And so uh, I know today's going to be a super awesome call. Um, but yeah, I guess that's now I work with uh, Shamrock Botics. We're a three-year-old team. Um, and, and I've been the drive coach for all three years. Cool. Thanks for that. Joy, how about you? Or as I was told in the chat, Dr. Tim. <laughs> you called on me just when I was trying to heckle you in the chat. But I was going to say we only heckle you because we like you, Chris. Um, so I'm Joy Doing. I work with Technocats at Kokomo High School. This is my ninth year working with them. Um, and the way that I got into FIRST Robotics is actually I was tricked into it. Um, I spent 10 years teaching middle school and then moved to the high school, wanted to do an extracurricular and uh, was told there's robotics or cheerleading. I'm like, well, I'm definitely not doing cheerleading. I wasn't really sure about doing robotics, um, but one of my students came to me and said, oh yeah, it's great, you'll love it. And one of the other coaches said, oh, our season's only six weeks. I'm like, okay, six weeks I can handle, um, which was a total lie because we all know it's year round and completely takes over your life. Um, but I've really enjoyed it and it's been um, a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Um, last summer I learned to solder, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, I think I've been drive coaching like six years maybe. Okay, great. Soldering's a good skill. Yes. Liz, how about you? Um, well, I am a first alum. I was on a team in high school uh, where I was a student drive coach in high school. Um, way back when, um, and then I've spent uh, a number of years volunteering, um, especially as an FTA. So I get to interact with a lot of different drive teams and watch a lot of matches um, as a volunteer. Um, and I've been with the Cybertooth team 3940 since uh, 2013 um, and uh, the drive coach since 2014 on that team. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of where I am, but I've, I've been doing a lot of first for a number of years um, and I uh, work for Andy Mark now. So that's fun. Great. Lenny, how about you? Yeah. So um, my experience is very similar to Danny's. Um, I am a first alum. I started in 2007. Um, I was on the team from 2007 to 2009. And then from 2009 on, I've been the drive coach on the team. Uh, my senior year, I was actually on the drive team as well. Um, so that makes 14 years all with 1018. Don't know nothing else. All right. And I think it was my first year in this role. Um, so three years ago. And at that point, you would have been a mentor drive coach for maybe five or six years. And yeah, amount of time, six or so. Yeah, and I had I had come up to you and said, "So when are you graduating from high school?" And you were just yeah. real nice about it too. You just got that big smile, and, and you just said, "Yeah, I'm I'm 26 years old." Yeah. Yeah. So it's real casual. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Tom. How about you? Um, I've been in first since 2005, and I was heavily recruited by Dan Newby from 447 to be a mentor. Um, I actually have a degree in robotics, but that was 34 years ago. So I've been doing robotics a long time. So that's the, once they found out, they came recruiting me pretty heavily. And so I started doing that. And I think, um, I can't remember what year I started doing the drive coach, but I was a drive coach for 447 and I bought a horse farm farther out and bought more land and so that's why i moved out to Knightstown and then became the drive coach so that team was going to fold so i kind of moved over there and helped it keep going so that was really what i tried to do out there okay well great so um as i uh, mentioned to all of you before uh there's a lot of different things in terms of of drive teams and we probably could spend a whole hour just on how do you select a drive team and how do you train a drive team? Um, of course, part of that being you have to have a robot before competition, uh, which teams don't always have. But really what I wanted to talk about today uh, is now you have your drive team, now you have your robot, whether you've had the practice with it or not, um, you're at a competition. So 
kind of day one, uh, you get the match schedule. Hopefully you get your match schedule <laughs> uh, um, ahead, of the, uh, ahead of time um, to where at least you can spend maybe at least an hour or two looking at, at your matches. I suppose that's my first question is, um, you know, kind of after you get that schedule, what's the first thing that you guys do? And, and you know, we'll kind of keep it chaotic because I like chaotic. So if any of you want to jump in, um, kind of what's the first phase? And you guys can also yep. use the chat to let me know if you want to answer or not answer certain questions. But uh, Tom, is there something you do with uh, Last well, Crusaders? Once we get once you get the schedule, you're going to look at it and see um, what the strategy is. You're going to want to talk to your scouting. I think scouting is huge. Uh, you really want to go around and make sure that you can't do all tasks on the field. First, kind of sees that you can do part of a few things and you can do a few things really well. And so you really want to know what you do well and what the other teams do well and try to build a strategy in which uh, for each match on how you can capitalize on that. Okay. And so that really is what I try to do. And, and then I want to make sure that all the other teams or my subsystem teams that they're setting up their robot right, they're running the right autonomous mode and things like that for the strategy. So that's what we do. Okay. So kind of before that first match, any that Liz, do you guys, uh, Cybertooth, do you have anything you can do with your drive team? Kinda, and it could just either be before that first match or before each match. Gotcha. Uh, well, I think we all look at the schedule and we um, get scared because there are a lot of good teams in Indiana where we're like, oh, that's going to be a hard match. It's going to be a hard match too. Um, but uh, on Cybertooth, um, we try to break up the tasks into different kind of subgroups that we have. So we have our, our strategy group and we have our scouting group and then we have our drive team. And hopefully if our team is large enough, that's made up of different people. Um, so our strategy group are the people who kind of go around and find the other drive teams and they kind of do it, what Tom was talking about. They, they figure out what all the other robots on our alliance can do um, so that we can come up with a game plan for what we're going to do in that match. Um, and that's really important for us to um, have a game plan. Um, and uh, the way that we've run for the last few years is our strategy group kind of writes that down on a piece of paper and they'll hand that paper off to me as the drive coach um, and explain what that plan should be in the match. And maybe I'll ask some questions about it. Maybe, you know, okay, so we're gonna focus, you know, this, uh, we're gonna focus on um, you know, shooting in the high goal this year. Uh, so um, we're gonna do that from a match and all the other teams are gonna take care of these different aspects um, of the game. Um, and so we do that, um, and I, I really like having a physical piece of paper uh, because sometimes I don't remember what they told me and I forget. So having that piece of paper is really useful for me as a drive coach. Uh, so I know what the plan is. I can you know, show that plan to our driver and our operator and, and to our alliance partners so we all know that we're on the same page um, before the match. Okay, so you like to have a physical piece of paper go over that notes um lenny you guys do is there pre-match stuff you do or pre now that you've got your match schedule and you've as liz said you've looked at it and gone oh oh brother yeah and, and i want to say too that you know what works for 1018 won't work for everybody else the, the first thing i want to say is, is look at your resources and make sure you look what look at what's best for you don't just model what other people do um but i, I take a lot of stuff on my on myself um we we kind of go through the um to the thought process, just kind of trust in each other. Everybody has a role. So my role is to come with the strategy to make sure we look good. Um, drivers going out there, make sure the robot's going from point A to point B. Operators making sure that things are getting placed correctly. And so everybody's just focused on the certain task. Uh, I get the schedule. I don't try to talk to them up about highlights or any tough matches or anything like that. I like to keep my drive team really, you know, calm and cool. Um, hype when it needs to be hype, right? You know, we're on the field or right before a match. Um, but after that, you know, we kind of um, talk about little things we might have seen 
Um, we go we go and actually um, critique each other, see what we could have done better, whether it be my communication skills or, or some missed spots or some some lack of communication all, all around. So, but even before that, if we, when we first get the uh, the schedule, we I look at it, I see the tough matches. Um, I try to quickly determine based off either historic information or if let's say we're competing at later events throughout the year, um, I try to see what people have done already. So I kind of formulate what our record would look like, um, but still every single match we go out there and win. So I like for me to say, okay, we'll probably go, let's say four and six, if I'm looking at it from a very conservative standpoint, but I want to go, you know, I want to sweep it, right? I want to win every single match. So what can we do um, to win the match? How can we impact it? So I listen to, you know, no one knows their robot better than the other team. Go to the other team, ask them what their strengths are. Um, try to collaborate that with my with my data if I have it. If not, I just pretty much, you know, listen to them and, and see what they, they, uh, they have to do. I ask them what they want to do. Um, if it aligns, it makes the most sense for everybody. You know, that's all good. If it's not, I try to put in my two piece, my two cents, say, hey, I think this would make more sense. Um, I try to, you know, communicate back and forth. If, if I feel some resistance, I'm not, I'm not there to, you know, I'm not there to argue with anybody. Um, some teams are very proud. Um, some teams, you know, may know more than I do. So if you like, Hey, if you're confident, you want to do that, let's go that, you know, let's go that direction. Uh, once we're on the field, we all know it's all chaos. Things change, uh, whether it be robots breaking or, or a sudden change in strategy or different lanes being open. And we, we, uh, we change calls on the fly there. Okay. Yeah. And then we got, one question from Twitch, but or maybe it's a comment, but um, we'll have Joy and Danny chime in. Joy, are there some pre, kind of pre-competition, pre-match things you guys are doing? Um, well, right now we're a really small team, so most of my drivers are working in the pit. Um, but if I can get them away, we like to go talk to the other teams. Um, and like Lenny said, see what they're good at. Um, when last year we had a really good scout, and he would come to us before matches and say, okay, this team's really good at this, but they can't do that. Um, and so we, you know, talk to that team and sometimes they'd say they could do something that our scout knew they couldn't. So that um, kind of helped us plan our strategy. Um, my kids are young right now. They're all freshmen and sophomores. By the time they're juniors and seniors, um, I expect my drive team to be coming up with a strategy and I give them fewer hints. That's a fair point. <laughs> Danny, how about Shamrock? Or at least maybe even some of your past experiences too. Yeah, so one of the things that we try to do, um, best case scenario is, is sort of like that, that first loaded night of the tournament, you know, try to, you know, steal away the, you know, especially like the core driver, operator, human player, um, you know, and, and go kind of have a walk around the field. And so I kind of look at this as sort of like race car drivers doing, you know, walking the track, right, really trying to get a good solid feel for, for what this thing looks like. A lot of what a driver kind of does is have to sort of put their brain and put their eyeballs sort of in the robot, you know, 30 feet away from them off in some weird orientation. And so if they can get a really solid sort of walk around the field, um, you know, that, that kind of helps out. And, and we sort of have almost like a little bit of a visualization, you know, sort of session, a little bit of a, almost, it's almost a little meditative around, you know, like, you know, if we can, if we can get on the field greater, but, but, you know, then we'll go and we'll stand behind the driver wall and we'll just sort of say, Hey, like, this is where we're going to go do our best work for the weekend. And, and we sort of walk through a visualization of watching, you know, seeing the robot go be successful out on the field, watching the robot, you know, go do the things that, you know, we built it to do and, and just try to sort of help get, get them into that headspace. And then um, we sort of tend to maybe linger around a little bit after the driver meeting, the, the morning of sort of the first real day of competition. And we just kind of come back to that. We, re we revisit that again. Um, I sort of quoted to my drivers as, you know, we were um, in the driver meeting this, you know, at, at um, you know, this year at Bloomington, a line out of the movie Ford versus Ferrari and sort of said, hey, kids, like, you see that out there? The perfect match is, is just out there. Um, and just really trying to get them into the right, you know, sort of headspace, the right mindset. Um, and one of the things that we're really big on is, is how we set goals and, and like specifically sort of the things that we set goals around. Um, like everybody can attest to winning a match is so chaotic. It's, it's really hard to sort of judge, you know, if we won the match, does that make us a success or a failure? There's a lot of times, right? You win the match, but you broke down and it was all on your partners. And, and those are awesome situations. Woohoo. Um, but like, were we a success or a failure in that moment? So we try to set goals around, like, we're going to put in one more game piece than we did last match. That's something that we can control. 
Um, so we do a little bit of, you know, kind of that visualization that, you know, almost meditation to try to really get refocused around. This is our goals. This is how we measure ourselves. This is how we get ready for a match. Um, and really, this is how we go execute. And how do we go do that at a really big high level? So uh, one of the persons here had put um, pre-comp or match checklists. Do any of you all create checklists uh, that you go through before each match? I, I would guess that sometimes it's a checklist of um, turn robot on, or if you have a certain piece that maybe has to be pinned back in, or sometimes the starting configurations are different than like the match where you have to take it from the pit to the what was it 2015 there were a lot of robots in 2015 that had to like take something off to travel uh to the field and then have to put it back on well if you don't plug that <laughs> if you don't plug that back in it doesn't work right so do you guys create checklists like that or physical checklists or so try to um, make everybody do things the same way every time and that's kind okay. of one of the things i try to tell the kids is if you go out and do the same thing every time and then I do agree, you always want to talk with the other teams and let them do what they do best. So repetition. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. Doing the same thing, getting into a routine, you know, having the uh, same person, you know, is aligning the robot on the field so they know where that goes. Um, but on our team, uh, we, we like to utilize the technician role for a lot of the checklists. Uh, and we found that role to be super useful. Um, and on our team, the I like for the technician to be kind of a um, handoff person between the pits and the field. So that person can kind of be, uh, make sure that the, the pit crew has kind of gone through all their checklists and done all their system checks, making sure the robot's ready. Um, and then after that, the um, they can kind of transition to the field as well and make sure that okay the pit crew said that they didn't have time to uh, you know check to make sure that the uh, camera was set up right so that's something that we have to do on the field so they make sure that that kind of communication from pits to field is really solid um, so I find that role really really important. Um, and someone I, I can really utilize uh, to do a lot of that checklist stuff. Cool. Um, all right. Well, so um, thanks for answering that question. Peek over real quick. I don't see any others. So the next uh, kind of part of the conversation, and we'll have uh, Lenny uh, start us off here, is match play. So now as a drive coach, and maybe Lenny, if you don't mind, I mean, there might be, I'm, I'm sure most of the people watching um, are are familiar or whatever but maybe just kind of briefly talk a little bit about the, the coach's role is a little bit different even if you're a student uh, the coach's role is slightly different than any of the other roles so if you wouldn't mind maybe describing a little bit like what what can the coach do or not do uh dur during a match and then maybe just then kind of go and then the rest of us will just address the you know and you can also address kind of the what is you know what's lenny's approach to kind of drive coaching yeah so uh, one of the first things is uh the game changes from year to year um i know there's some games where you can't do anything but you know um give directions to the drivers sometimes you do certain things like um the year uh, 2017 where we could press the the button um versus some years we couldn't do anything right so there were some times where we had our power cubes and you notice oh in those last three seconds you slap the you know you slap the the button we could do that that year other years you can't do stuff like that um so usually you're there as an advisory role, just kind of watch things, talk to the other people, you know, I'll touch any game pieces, um, strictly just a coach, you know. Um, now my style of coaching, um, I, I kind of think of myself as uh, the brains. Um, so even before that, I, I like to, to point out that I don't like going to a competition with doing anything brand new. So we, we practice like we're playing a match at home, right? We, we, we simulate matches, we run in for the exact amount of time, we do our runs like we do in actual matches. We actually put robots on the field to simulate going through certain lanes that are open, that are closed. Um, I, I even blast EDM at our shop to simulate the noise at a competition. So they get used to me yelling in their ear or not being able to hear very well. I make them wear scratched up safety glasses so they have um, very low visibility. Nothing should be brand new to them. 
um, once they get to a competition is, is my is my job as a coach. So once we get there, it's all about um, making sure that I'm hitting my notes, um, certain key phrases that I may say to them say, okay, got it. I'm doing that. Um, one of my personal best years that I think that I had as a coach was 2017 Steamworks. And so we had a lot of different um, little bits and things that we would say to kind of talk about different lanes, whether we're going around the, uh, the ship or cutting through the, the near side or far side, or if we're going to do the, the eight or we're going the super long way, they, they mean just, I just two words and he knew which way he would go. And I watch all the lanes and he'd know what to do. He'd have to think about it. Just you hear the words and he'd do it. And I think that's, uh, I think we all want that as a drive coach is just, Hey, autonomy, everything's going just like, you know, like magic. So. Yeah. So good advice even for anybody who's playing the role of drive coach, whether it's a student drive coach or an adult drive coach is practicing that, that language. Yeah. Um, and so uh, even in, in, as a former sports coach, uh, I know that some, uh, I, I coach soccer and there are soccer coaches that have some lingo that they use, that they like to use for different positions on the field or for different kinds of, of runs that players like to make that, and then, yeah, as players get used to that vocabulary, right, right. Um, then you can start to see a uh, quicker response to it. Well, that's cool. All right. So, uh, Dr. Doing. Uh, so what's kind of your match philosophy? You're in, you're in the heat of the match. Yeah. Well, first, I want to show off my T-shirt from this year because they're really cool and we didn't get to compete this year. So here's our shirt. He's hanging from the switch. That's our cat, Mo. He's cousins with our school's mascot, mascot Coco. Um, so during matches, I try to keep my guys calm. Um, throughout our practices, we talk about communicating. I want them talking to each other um, so they can get to the point where they can kind of read each other's minds. And that's really the goal. Um, so I help them keep track of time. I help them see things maybe they can't. Um, I communicate with other coaches if we need help with something or if there's a problem. Um, but my main goal is to stay calm and keep my kids calm so that they're thinking. And that's a very similar style to what Danny has. He's very calm when he coaches. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> so Tom, uh, how about you? So uh, what are kind of things you, over the years that you've kind of learned as a drive coach that a, that a drive coach should be doing uh, during the match? Is there, uh, I guess maybe, is there something that you're like, you're particularly watching for maybe? And, and yeah, I know you're year watching, to year changes, but. You're watching the field. You're looking at how the game is unfolding. And I do agree with Joy. You have to stay calm all the time and you always have to keep those kids calm uh, <clears throat> and one of the things i try to do is get the other team to get excited on the other side <laughs> and make them mess up so uh, but no we one of the things you might do is communicate with the other coaches we broke down a lot sometimes i had a year where we broke a lot and so if you can't do what you say you're going to do. And the other thing is watch the time. Um, Cause usually with the end game, um, you know how long it takes for them to get and they're busy running cycles. And I usually make them stay doing their cycles and then, okay, now it's time to go the end game. And we don't go running into walls at hundred miles an hour like some teams. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> you know who you are uh but that's that's it yeah. okay yeah I th the um watching the clock i can imagine is, is very important i think sometimes as a spectator uh the uh, a three minute match um can sometimes feel like six or seven minutes but down there i'm sure it feels like it's about 12 seconds um, and so it, it can probably, sometimes it can probably go pretty quick unless, unless you're dead in the water. And I'm sure then it can probably feel like 12 minutes. But yeah. Absolutely. When you're dead, those matches are so long. Yeah. Uh, Danny, kind of the match play, what, what, what's going through your mind as a coach? So one of the things that I like to do, um, you know, especially like in the, like the, 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 30 seconds just before the match starts, you know, as the, uh, the MC is going around doing their introductions, like 
one of the things I see is sort of part of my role, even within like the whole alliance, is I, I bring a little bit of like levity to the whole situation. Um, I'm goofy. We're, we have our little shamrock shake, you know, dance that we do before the start of the match and, and whatnot, just to kind of keep people, you know, loose and, and kind of going. And, um, you know, and then and then the match starts, you know, there, there's a lot of communication, you know, there's a lot of, you know, hey, we're gonna go get that ball, we're gonna go put it over there, we're gonna go do that. And part of what I'm looking for is trying to like, take sort of that that high level sort of step back. I know my driver is looking at sort of the four to six feet in front of the robot. And so I kind of try to take the role to try to be a little bit, you know, sort of farther back, a little bit more sort of whole field so that we can sort of watch when, when are those open lanes, you know, that Lenny was talking about, where are those good driving positions? You know, last year with, you know, scoring game pieces, um, we sort of found our role as like, you know, we would sort of, you know, dart in and put one into the rocket, you know, out of the way of our partners that were trying to do stuff. And so that really kind of, a lot of that felt to me to try to look for those openings and those good spots of when we could sort of, you know, break away from our normal play and, and get in to go do something that, that would be really beneficial to the Alliance. Um, and, and kind of like Joe said, like, or Joy said, I, I really do try to be a really calming sort of presence for my driver and operator, like while the match is going on, because, you know, them thinking really, really clearly will help them perform better, you know, out on the, you know, with, with the robot. Um, and I really like a quote from Phil Jackson, you know, super legendary basketball coach um, from the Bulls and, and the Lakers and, and all over, um, you know, he, and he talks about like, doing the thing that your players need, regardless of if, if it's your style or not. And so, you know, I've had years where, where I had, you know, drivers that like, if, if I start to show a little bit of, of worry or concern, or if, if I really, if, if I start to go, like they will sort of react to that, you know, at a, at a unconscious level, right. If, if they start to hear a lot of worry in my voice, you know, they'll just, they'll just take off, you know, and, and, and now they're not focused on driving. They're not focused on doing their thing. You know, they're, they're just feeling that anxiety and getting all worked up. And so I need to come in and be super level. So I work on voice control, you know, and, and how I deliver messages, not just what I'm saying. Like it's really easy to sort of point at a ball and say that ball over there. Um, but you can say that in a lot of different tones, right? We can say, that ball over there! or, or you can kind of calmly come through and say, that ball and, and be clear, give instruction and, and, you know, sort of put people at ease a little bit. Um, and to the, one of the things about time, uh, my drivers know this on like a cognitive level, but in a match, it never really resonates. Um, I lie to them about the time all the time. And it's, it's a vehicle to infer pace, right? If, if we've got to go do one more game piece and we have, you know, 10 seconds left, but I know, and I know they can do it in 10 seconds, but I need them to feel like they have 20 seconds. I'll just tell them you've got 20 seconds, go do it. Um, you know, and, and that's a lot of that, that, like that sort of stuff really comes late in the season when you've had a, a lot of time to really get with the game and really get with your drivers. Um, you know, but it's really being able to build that, that relationship of giving them the messaging that they need to go do the thing at that highest level. Um, and I, I had a really, really great driver, operator, coach, sort of triplet pairing thing, um, you know, from, it was like for through a little bit, well, 15, but 15 was weird. And then 16 and 17, and the three of us really got in a really, really strong spot. Um, and so we were able to really do a lot, you know, just sort of on almost voice inflection and, and intonation, almost more than the, the words that were being said. And that just a lot of that comes with practice and, and, you know, really trying to, to dial in on, on those little things. Cool. Um, so, do, so the, uh, the lying about the time works because they, they don't see it on their computer. They don't see it. The drivers. Okay. Cause it's, and it's, you could tell, like, you could say, Hey, you've got 10 seconds and you can deliver even that message, right? It, say that's the truth, right? You could deliver that message in like a, it's okay. We can take our time. Everything's going to be all right. We've got 10 seconds or, Hey, come on, let's go. We've got 10 seconds, right? Yeah. You have two very different messages there. Yeah. And I've typically found that the second one, while it may get them to hurry, it, 
you get that little bit of that rush, right? Sometimes we need people to pick up the pace, but when they rush, that's a lot of times when mistakes happen. And, and when you need somebody to do something in that last little brief moment, you need them to do it perfect, right? They got to hit their mark and, and do it just bang on. And when you're rushing, that, that little edge of perfections, you know, tends to, to be the first thing that goes. So that's why, you know, it's like, hey, we've got time. Let's go do it. Yeah. The way you're playing around with a 125 pound piece of machinery, sometimes rushing is too much risk. So, um, well, very good. All right, Liz, your match play. Yeah, I, I, uh, a lot of what Danny said is, is similar. Um, I like the lying about the time. I find there's certain keywords I say all the time when I'm drive coaching and you've got plenty of time is definitely one of those, no matter how much time is actually left, right? Go, oh, yeah, you've got plenty of time for that last game piece or that climb or you have, you know, take your time, um, focus. I say that a lot, um, but um, I like to, I like to say like one step ahead and, and be, be planning out what the next move is. Uh, while the drivers themselves are really focusing, like Danny said, like, right. It, it, on the, exactly what's happening right now, making sure they're accurately picking up game pieces and that kind of thing. And then, and I, I find my role to be, you know, scouting out where the next piece game pieces on the floor that they have to pick up or how much time we have left, you know, like Danny said, where our alliance partners are so we can get a clear path back to, you know, the rocket or the goal or whatever, whatever the game element is this year. Um, and that's what I find myself doing. Um, and then, and then also, um, I think Joy mentioned this, uh, communicating with the Alliance. And like Tom said, especially when you're broken or things aren't going exactly the way you planned, um, maybe your intake's broken and you need to communicate that, you know, okay, we can't score cargo this round. Um, so maybe we have to switch up that strategy. Um, I find that's important to uh, run back and forth and let the other teams know, hey, something is, either going really well or, or maybe um, maybe they got tied up focusing on something else and they need to come back and, and climb or whatever the end game is. Um, I find that important too, to make sure that everyone's on the same page and, and, and keeping track of what's going on in the match. Because it's so short, it's very short. Right, <laughs> it's short, you've got a bunch, but yeah, but each one is very short. Uh, certainly a little bit different than coaching a hour and a half football game or a half. Um, so a couple questions on uh, the Twitch chat prior to kind of going to the third phase of kind of post-match debrief. Uh, one is what is your most effective recovery strategy for when a, uh, a mechanism fails on your robot? Any, any um, so oh, I think everyone's had this happen before, <laughs> um, but you know, I think knowing what your robot capabilities are um, is really important. So, um, you know, if there are two tasks in the game, you know, if you, you know, your hatch panel mechanism broke um, and now you need to focus on cargo, you know, maybe your alliance can help um, support you in that and, and switch that up. Um, maybe you have to go play play defense. But I think um, one of the one of the things that uh, you know, I try not to do as a coach is, is kind of be like indecisive on what, what is next to do. Cause then you kind of end up sitting there spinning in circles, not really being effective at anything. So if it's, oh yeah, like that's definitely not working. We're not picking up, we're not picking up the game piece anymore. Um, we need to go do something. Let's, let's focus on that. We have 40 seconds or let's come back and climb or hang early. Um, that's that's going to be the most effective way to score points right now, um, and and redirect that way. Any other uh, answers to that one? That uh, you've had recovery strategy for a mechanism failure. I think one of the things that I've tried to do is I I definitely see that when we do have something go sort of mechanically or, or or physically wrong, you know, with the robot. I know my communication will sort of start to be like, hey, like words turn into sentences. So like, Hey, let's go do that thing over there. Right. You know, we sort of like, as a, as a team try to like talk it out, like somebody says, Hey, I can't do this with the robot anymore. We sort of, okay. You know, like let's, let's drop that and do the thing. I, I find that 
the farther you get from plan A, the more that you need to communicate and, you know, and, and really try to like spell things out a little bit, obviously short match, you're trying to recover as, as much as you can. So there's like not a time to like write a novel, um, you know, but, but you, the farther you get away from that plan A, you, you, the more you need to try to really make sure that there's, there's not a lot of ambiguity. And right. If we just start, you know, saying like, to do that thing over there, you might have the plan well mapped out in your mind. We can't do this. Okay. We're going to, you know, move the arm down, do the thing. And so you just skip to the end and say, go do that thing over there. While now your driver and operator are trying to decode your messaging. And, and there's, you know, that that's not a great place to be either. So that's why I think, you know, you get into that spice, you get a little bit more communication going. Okay. Anyone else on that? Or? I think you need to sometimes uh, make sure you communicate it to the other drive teams and let them know what the strat that your strategy has now changed <laughs> for that match. <laughs> it's about doing whatever you can because if you were going to climb and somebody else can climb, you need to tell them to come back and climb. You will play D. So you got to, right. you have to communicate it to the other drive teams. Yeah, they'll probably start to see something's going wrong, but they won't necessarily know why. So communicating that to them. Yeah. It's such a different um, atmosphere back there than, than it is in a, a traditional sporting event because it's, it's, it's always one team versus another. Uh, so when you've got two basketball teams on a court, you don't have to worry about some other basketball team you're trying to coordinate your efforts with. Um, I think that's one of the really kind of cool things about what, uh, what our program is, is doing. Uh, and then another question is, uh, what is, I think we know um, Liz's is we've got plenty of time. Uh, what's your top tagline that you use when teaching your drivers? So do you have a tagline that you use? Um, and I'm just kidding, Liz, yours might not just be, you've got plenty of time. Um, but uh, the one that I've always used is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And I've, I heard that somewhere long, long ago, but again, trying to get people into that right mindset of if I do it right the first time, it'll go a lot quicker than if I do it fast, make a mistake, have to back up, reshift, and and then do it right the second time. So really try to get people in like, we will, let's work on being precise now. And if we do that over and over and over again, we will get fast later. But like for right now, it's let's just let's just be accurate. Let's be consistent. Let's be good, and and the pacing will come over time. But slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. And you don't have to have a tagline. Uh, this was just one of the questions. But do any of the rest of you have a tagline? You got this. That's what I always tell you. Them. Got this. You got this. You can handle it. A lot of a lot of small schools. Some of them don't have the confidence. And I, I almost didn't even field a drive team this year. I didn't have enough kids that wanted to be on the drive team. <laughs> so that's very odd, but I, I've struggled with that the last two years, getting enough kids just to be on the drive team. So it's a lot of confidence to push them that they can do it. So that's, that's something from a small school, I guess. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then uh, we'll kind of move into the uh, kind of the end, the last kind of, well, the third piece. And then, well, I've got some questions is, is post-match. So we've, we've played the match. You've focused on the things you've won, you've lost. Um, uh, what's you're walking away kind of post-match. What's, what's your plan? Uh, do you do anything uh, organized uh, or does it depend on the match? Um, I mean, just kind of coming, I think those of, who have been around first know that um, early matches sometimes, um, to the fans anyway, seem not to have a lot of implications to them. A win is a win, and that's a good thing. As we get late into Friday and then early Saturday morning, the intensity really steps up. And I'm sure that, that as you go through the weekend, post-match can become a very intense time. Um, as you're getting closer to, are we in that top eight? Are we in the last three or four? Are we, you know, are we, are we on a downtrend and uptrend? So I know there's probably a lot of, of things to it, but do you have a consistent post-match? So we'll, uh, we'll start with Joy. Yeah, I said it. I called her Joy. But that's what my name is. Joy's great. Um, one thing I do is after the match, 
often I won't let them talk about the match until we're back in the pit. Um, I want them to have time to think about it. I want them to have time perhaps to calm down. Perhaps I need time to calm down before I say anything to them. Um, but you know, if something went great or we had some strategy, um, I want to discuss that with them rather than letting everybody else hear that. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll have to take other team members who are on the drive team and just, you know, push them away for a little bit. And like, we'll talk to you in a few minutes, not now. Um, but then when we get back to the pit, um, we tell the pit what happened. If something didn't work, we tell them um, what didn't work rather than trying to say this specific thing broke. We won't, don't want to send them down a rabbit trail that might be the wrong one. So we tell them what happened. Um, and then we talk about what happened in the match, what went well, what didn't go well. And our goal is to always improve. So we want every single match to be better than the last one. What do we need to do to make that happen? Okay. Um, Lenny, what are you doing post-match? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned before, um, we, we at TNT kind of operate, everyone has a role, um, trust that person. Um, so I wouldn't expect, you know, um, somebody from the pits or even from anyone from the stands to come and tell me or any of my drivers what to do, what they did wrong, uh, besides the scout uh, mentor who very much lets me know what I did wrong. Um, but besides them, uh, we all we all kind of trust each other. So uh, I give them, so after the match is over, um, we we talk, but the very first thing is we take the robot to the pit. We uh, I give down the run the rundown of what, what happened during the match or some things to kind of look at um, to our, um, to we call it like the pit boss the responsible kind of a checklist of like, uh, hey, what went wrong with that match? Or what are some bumps that might have been taken? And then from there, um, they say, thank you so much. They may double check with the driver if I'm not clear. Sometimes I'm real jazzed after a match. Um, so I'm not too clear if I'm like not being clear enough. They may ask the driver directly or anyone else if they need more information. Um, after that, we kind of go into a quiet spot, talk about how the match went. Sometimes it's um, a long conversation, sometimes it's not. Um, but more or less, um, one of my big things that I try to do is making sure that everybody's good. I feel like um, perfect example, uh, we had the, uh, the boiler bot battle and I was circulating between two brand new drivers and two brand new drive teams. And um, one driver, we had a really good match. And after the match, so he kind of looked at me and he was like, my hands. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I went to go give him like two high fives and his hands were like just trembling, right? From adrenaline. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, are you okay? Your hands are okay. And he's like, yeah, I'm fine, but I've never had this happen. So like, it's fine. Like, you know, you know, your energy's pumping, keep talking to make sure it's fine. And I actually let somebody else to grab, like, typically I grab the uh, driver's station, stuff like that. So obviously I was sending to that kid. So I said, Hey, grab this, go grab the robot. And actually I almost forgot the robot that match just cause I was so worried about the driver's hands shaking, but I make sure that they're okay. Cause you know, things may happen, especially you have people that have may have panic attacks or, or suffer um, from other illnesses. So you definitely want to make sure everybody's so, so good um, after going through, a, you know, uh, an event like a match, especially a hectic one. Um, so just talk, double checking, make sure everybody's good. Everybody's kosher, make sure that we all understand what we could have worked on. Um, and then obviously, um, there's different states for different types of matches. So let's say if it's, uh, at state and we're, we know we're going home or we're not going to worlds it's a little bit more emotional. Um, so at, at that point I try to, you know, pick my words carefully. Cause I, I you know, you guys see me cry enough, but I try really hard not to cry and have my kids cry at events. So I try to be very inspiring and, and, you know, march on. Um, but you know, sometimes you can't help it. Yeah, there's there's definitely that um, those matches at personal 2016 when I realized I'd just seen my son drive for the last time. You know, when you do the math in your head and you're like, oh, yeah, and I'm sure from a coach perspective because you get pretty close to the to the kids as mentors and and it, and especially if they've been around for four years and a senior and they're about to go. Uh, Liz, post match, do you guys have kind of a routine or? Uh, yeah, we definitely have a routine. Um, uh, first off, we try to uh, keep track of any, you know, mechanical or, or issues that um, we saw in the match and try to report that right away to the pit crew. Um, but we really like to try, as long as we have enough students on the team, we like to try to keep the drive team and the pit crew separate and really do like a handoff to the pit crew. So uh, usually the pit crew is waiting, you know, in the hallway um, for the robot to, to come out from the field and we try to hand off and then, and then split off to hopefully a quiet place where we can do a match debrief um, where we'll sit with just the drive 
team and and kind of review what happened, what went well, what maybe could have gone a little bit better. Um, and then we also have our Andy Baker report from the stands um, where Andy likes to come and have a kind of a checklist of what you know he thinks we can improve on. And that's kind of helped um, kind of filter you know the the stands opinion of what happened right and that's kind of easier to do when you're winning um but not so easy to do if maybe you're not doing so hot during the during the matches um where you know a lot of times you get the people in the stands who may not have known what the strategy was or may not have known what's going on um you know trying to say oh we should have done this this and this um but kind of objectively having metrics to keep track of um with, with once again i like a paper sheet that, that we can keep track of that kind of thing um we can kind of say no you know <laughs> we weren't uh you know we weren't uh wasting time you know actually it was our uh, you know intake that was having some issues like oh okay that makes more sense like i can report back on that or, or maybe like oh no you know we um you know, we chose, you know, we weren't going to hang that match because our two partners were, were better at that. So that they're going to do that, that match. Um, but we really tried to, um, especially find some sort of a quiet meeting spot um, in the venue that we can take a break. So you'll, you'll find us at some obscure bench somewhere in the hallway, um, sitting on the floor a lot of the time. Um, and, and that kind of just helps keep everybody's uh, heads clear and, and keep some calm and relaxed um, in between matches. Um, it's really hard and uh... oh, we've got a frozen Liz. That's okay. She'll join us back here in a minute. I used to do it. I run from oh. the field. What's on the team, and that ends up being really stressful uh, all day doing that um, all the time. So. Um, and try to try to avoid that and and at least have some cool down time it seems like and tom will uh be the last one on this topic but i am hearing a common theme that it seems like there's quite a bit of uh feedback from the stands <laughs> after each match uh so tom what, what do you what do you guys do kind of post-match you do hear a lot of feedback from the stand <laughs> whether you like it or not mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of the things we try to do is, uh, since we're small, is just make sure talking to the driver and human player, did the robot work like they thought? Was mm -hmm. was everything working okay? Was it driving okay? Mm -hmm. Was um, And then we get it back to the pits and we communicate that to the drive team. Then I pull them aside and I talk to them. But I want the kids to actually explain to the pit crew what they were seeing with the robot so what needs to be checked what needs to be looked over what needs to be fixed and then i pull them aside and we talk about the strategy and did how did the strategy go that's the way i do it so okay mm -hmm. um the uh i'm looking at the chat uh right now i haven't seen questions come through but one thing i'm wondering is from um, your team's perspectives uh what do you do to prepare your your drive team specifically in terms of knowing the rules of the game? Uh, do you uh, do you set expectations that your drivers have to do do tests? Do you do your drivers have to show a, um, a pro, you know a proficiency of the rules before you let them get the controls in their hands? I, I see Joy kind of going, yeah. <laughs> I needed a heartbeat and some of mine just have no drivers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tom, Tom just wants Tom just wants some drivers. And that's interesting too. Um, I think maybe some people uh, in, in the world of first might see, you know, maybe even even if the team is uh, 20 or 30 students, or maybe even if it's just 10 students, some people look at the drive team and they think, well, doesn't everybody want to be a driver? Uh, so apparently maybe that's not that's, that's not, not the case, the case. Uh, I've, I've had to fight to get kids down there in the last two years it sort of sounds like when you're coaching little tyke soccer and you're it's the first year there's goalies mm -hmm. and you have to find somebody who wants to play goal i'm not gonna play goalie uh and that you know and then you finally find that one kid and then they're stuck playing goalie for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. um but uh okay so but uh joy what about the rules do you guys do quite a bit of rule prep 
We do. Um, starting with the day of kickoff, we start going through the rules immediately. Um, but we do a game test every year and all of our students have to earn 70% on it to travel. And then our drive team and our scouting lead and our team leads have to get 90%. Um, they're allowed to retake it as many times as they want. Once they miss it, we give them the test back. They have to go find the answers, but it really gets that those rules ingrained in their head. Okay. Anybody else test? I know there are quite a few teams out there that give tests kind of like what Joy was talking about. Uh, yeah, we usually give some sort of a game test. This year we actually didn't do a game test. Um, and really I think, uh, you know, the reason for that is the students who were involved just like were really, really passionate about the rules anyway. So it kind of, you know, I felt comfortable that they knew how this game was being played. So rules test is kind of a little extra onto that. Um, I know, uh, I know Danny loves rules tests and he, he <laughs> loves taking our team's rules tests, especially uh, when I give that out. So. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't, re we don't start at a rules test. Um, my philosophy is like when we're trying to figure out who might be the, the driver and operator is like, we start at mindset actually and then we work towards skill set driving the robot and we sort of fly into the assumption that we can like the rules are the easy part to teach if you don't have the right mindset that you're like whatever if you don't have like you can probably teach a bit of the skill set if you have enough time um and you can definitely teach the rules uh you know with whatever the new game might be okay yeah I, uh, teaching uh calm under pressure is a little bit different and teaching go under there and swipe that thing and you get points for it, right? Or you're not allowed to hit another robot in that box. Right. Um, there is a question here. Uh, do you document data after a match, such as maybe a strategy to change or a mechanism that should be revisited? Uh, so I know a lot of teams have, um, some, especially some of the bigger teams have uh, very elaborate scouting data. I suppose scouting data might be a little bit different than what this person is asking. Like, do you as a drive coach, are you documenting anything uh, robot wise or strategy wise? And we've got a couple minutes left. So, well, I'll be quick, real quick. Um, so kind of tying into like the, what do you do post-match? We don't necessarily win every match, but we will celebrate the wins in every match. So for us, it's really big to like, as we're coming off the field, we have a, a sort of a Slack channel where we call it match report and we'll put in like, this is the cool stuff that we did. And if there was anything that, you know, went totally bananas, um, you know, and, and so we do try to data log that and we do try to kind of keep tally of that sort of stuff. Um, I guess I, I'll just wrap with this. We've got about a minute and a half left. Um, so it sounds like in some cases it's hard to get drive uh, people that really want to do this. Um, how many of you have backups? And I mean, have you had to use them? I mean, do you, because kids get sick or kids have AP exams or they, because they're not just in robotics, but they're maybe also in something else, then it might be academic and they can't miss. Uh, so, or maybe they're your chairman's presenters too, or dean's list. Sure. Yeah. And then they are slotted to miss a match. Um, so do you, do you just train, do you intertrain the team that once you choose a drive team, do you just intertrain or do you bring somebody else in or? Yeah, I'll, I'll make this quick, but yeah, we, um, so we have a backup for every single position, um, and, and kind of just to tie everything up. Um, one of the most important things that you can have with your team is trust. And just, you know, one of the things that I tell everybody is that we're trusting you to do these roles. We wouldn't put you in a position to be un unsuccessful. And, and I talk about my, my brother's actually the, the, uh, the scout uh, captain for a mentor, right? And I trust him with, with my life. So if he tells me something, I'm trusting him that this is the truth. I don't, I don't second guess it. And that's what we all have in 1018 is just we trust each other in whatever role we're in. Cool. Well, that's probably a, a, a nice way to wrap. And I think that's true. I think it, here's another way that that first and and sport uh, definitely are um, very similar uh, athletes on a basketball court or a soccer field uh, have to have that same trust and know that if I kick the ball over there, you'll go get it, um, even if it looks like a scary thing to do. Um, uh, but yeah, I appreciate all your time. Uh, Danny, 
Shamrock Botics, uh, Joy from Technocast, Liz from Cybertooth, Lenny from uh, Pike, Robo Devils, and Tom from Last Crusaders. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining me this evening um, and your wisdom. Uh, this was a really nice conversation. I appreciated it. Uh, and have a nice evening. We're going to now transition to our next segment, which uh, should be a good one. Uh, we're going to have a couple of students come on and talk about STEM inclusion. So bye, Ray. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Lucy. Hello. Hi, Lucy and Anjali from Team 461. Yep. Uh, uh, you guys are going to be talking about STEM inclusion this evening. Uh, and I am going to uh, disappear and let you guys have that conversation. I'll uh, I'll watch the chat. If there's any questions, I can uh, I can chat them to you. Okay. Yep. All right. Take it away. All right. So as Chris said, I'm Lucy. I'm a senior on Team 461, and I am our head of media on the team. And I'm also on the student board of directors. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Anjali. I'm also on Team 461. I'm a sophomore and I'm our outreach head. All right, so to get started today, we're going to talk on two different scales. We're going to talk about what we kind of do on our team as like a small, and then we're going to spread out to what we try and do in our community to continue to spread STEM and be inclusive towards all. So on our team, we make sure that we're including everyone specifically because we have a wide variety of students. So our demographics of our team, we have 17% LGBT members, 38% of members on our team are female, 69% people on our team are people of color. And that is not just on our team, but those percentages are equally mirrored on to our leadership positions. So in our leadership positions, 33% of our leadership positions are filled by LGBT students, 66% are people of color, and 55% are women on our leadership team. So we make sure that our team is portrayed accurately by whoever our leaders are. And we make sure that everyone on our team is being included. When we start out getting members from our team every year from recruitment, we have a club rush at our school and we make sure that we reach out to anyone and everyone who comes by. We don't discriminate, we're always open and we're asking people to come join our team. And when they do come to the shop, we make sure that no one's being excluded on like our first tours of the shop or anything that we're doing. We make sure that everyone gets equal chances to try out any sub team or every sub team. They can try driving the robot, they can try programming, they can really try anything. And we make sure that we monitor our new members as well as our older members. We're constantly reaching out to them, making sure, hey, if you haven't been showing up to a few meetings, something wrong, what can we do? And we're just always checking in, making sure that we're including people on our team so that when it comes to spreading some to our community, we can just continue that spread outwards. So, so yeah, um, <laughs> we, so yeah, what Lucy was talking about and really making sure even during like recruitment times and stuff like that, that we are really making sure that everyone on our team is being really open with everyone, including everyone, letting everyone try out the robots, just stuff like that. And also just kind of creating a type of familial bond within our team, just so that people will always feel like they're they're in a family and they're not feeling inhibited or anything like that because that anyone feeling inhibited feel, will, it, it kind of decreases the inclusivity of your team in general. So just making sure that everyone always feels welcome within the team. And then moving past that, um, we really focus on kind of bringing that out into our community. And we do that a lot through the different outreach events that we do. Um, so one of these outreach events is Minorities in Engineering. Uh, we do that in partnership with Purdue's Minorities in Engineering program. So every year during the summer, we do a kind of summer camp for about a week where um, minorities throughout the country who are interested in STEM will apply to the program through Purdue. And then we go in as a FRC team in our community and go and present different things Last year, we did a FOL type um, 
FLO style robots where we brought in all of our old NXTs and little like robot kits and we had them each build their own robot. So it was really interesting and they saw different aspects of first, right? Because it was a little bit younger for their age group, but it was definitely something that they could go back home to wherever they lived throughout the country and kind of go to a first team. And it was a really fun experience. Um, they learned how to program these FLL style robots. And then we also did a sumo competition, which was basically you have a large like style plate thing and the robots both try to push each other off. So it was a really fun introduction to um, people who might not have had a lot of chances to work with robotics. Um, also, we did a little bit of scratch programming so that they would get some like exposure to different styles of programming. Of course, as, as an outreach event, just in general for, especially for outreach events that are focused on inclusivity, you can't assume that people have all had the same experiences or chances to deal with different types of programming or whatever else you're doing, which is why sometimes it is better to do something like plan for the activity to be a little bit less complex. And then it's always good to just, you can have the people build their own complexity. So like FLO style robots, they're for FLO, right? Which you would think is a little bit less complex, but when you kind of let your imagination run, those robots can get really complex really fast. So it's a really fun activity. Yeah, another really cool event that we have had the opportunity to be a part of is something that was quite local and it is an event called Inspire to Innovate, but it is ran by this large organization called Deaf Kids Code. So at this specific event, we ran kind of a demo of sorts where we had an FTC sized robot and we also brought one of our older FRC robots that anyone from the community, especially the kids and especially those with hearing disabilities could come and they could drive the robot. They could talk to us about what robotics is and we can try and get them involved in a variety of ways. Specifically, I believe we brought our Stronghold robot and we had it be able to just do anything. They can shoot something or they can just drive around in this space that we had. We were there with a bunch of other um, groups. So it wasn't just a direct, this is a 461 event. This is just what we're doing. This was part of something bigger. And we kind of got an opportunity to have this demo program and help spread it to a community along with other students. So we weren't the only people there. So we could kind of learn from how other people are interacting and we can take that more on our team. We had quite a few students come and we had a variety of kids come and try our robot and learn about robotics. We had some Girl Scouts who were there at the event with their troops from all the way from the youngest to the oldest of students. But we also had a lot of deaf students, which was something new for a lot of members on our team to interact with. It was just a really inspiring event for us to go to and to work on. Um, one of our other events is um, a Girl Scout workshop. So we aim to um, bring or allow um, women to come into STEM, come experience first and STEM. So at these workshops, what we try to do is we try to introduce first as an option for girls who really are interested in it and want to continue the STEM experience that they have in our workshop. So we introduce first, we introduce our team at the beginning and then so the badges that they come to our shop to get are designing robots, programming robots, and showcasing robots. So what we have them do is we have them design and build a prosthetic hand. So we give them a lot of various materials like pipe cleaners and cardboard and strings, and they have access to hot glue guns and all of that stuff. And it's just a fun activity to show how fun STEM fields can be and just like how using your brain and problem solving and logic, just like building something can be. Um, and after that, we, similar to what we do with minorities in engineering actually, um, let them build a Lego robot and let them program it to do specific tasks that we would have set out beforehand, such as driving in a circle or <laughs> driving in a square or even things like 
attaching sensors to it and if they're if it's going to run into things then it'll back up stuff like that um due to the coronavirus situation lately we actually have started putting it online and making kind of online demonstrations so that's been a lot more of um python coding and like things like that so a little bit more advanced but also easily easy enough and entertaining enough that people will stick with it it's also really great because we can do them for longer times and longer events um, alongside this we really try to make sure that um, everyone kind of participates in these events so that um, people will really get the opportunity to interact with other people that they might not have interact with like young girls is not a demographic that a lot of people get to interact with so just making sure that different that we all interact with different demographics and we also do another specifically shop for specifically girls and this is called girl coders in this workshop we've kind of created two different levels so that we can work with girls who are younger and might not be more knowledgeable or they might not have the skill set needed for the advanced, but we have two different levels. And on the beginning level of this, we teach things like cybersecurity and teaching them how the internet works. For our cybersecurity, we had girls and we had their Play-Doh. And how this worked was that they had an individual color of Play-Doh for themselves. It was their color and it was kind of, if you're on the internet, this is you, like you are this color, this is your identity. And then we talked with them about how can you help protect yourself? And so you might protect yourself with one thing and that adds another color to the mix. And when you mix that Play-Doh together, it's not the same color as you originally were. And so by adding more of these things to protect yourselves, it forms a totally different color that you weren't originally. And by including girls in this topic that even now not a lot of people know about and changing it to a way that is easier to understand, especially for a younger audience, was something that we could really help them with. And these girls started to get a grasp of it from incorporating it at kind of a different educational standpoint, rather than being like, well, here are all of these terms. We we're like, okay, here's Play-Doh. This is you, this is your color. And the other like basic level that we had was teaching them how the internet works, like with routers and with what the internet actually is. These girls would were separated into three different groups spread around our shops that they couldn't really hear or talk to each other. But they were sitting here and they had to try and pass notes to someone in a different group. So we taught them about, well, if you write this note, how are you gonna have to format this note to give it to the group leader? And then how is the group leader gonna give that to whoever was running around as the internet? and having it as more like a group-based activity so they can relate what the internet actually is to like what they're actually experiencing. And we had this workshop created so that people who might not get a hands-on basis with this can actually learn about the internet in a different way. And when we went to our more advanced workshops, we had the girls start with programming a very basic website. Some girls made pictures of cats on their website, just put anything and everything on there. And we had this as something where we had a lot of students who were around to help. We almost had a one-on-one -on -one ratio of student to our students who were helping. So we could make sure that we were going around and be like, hey, are you stuck? Like, what's this? Rather than making them reach out for help. Because a lot of times if a student is sitting there and they don't know, they might not ask for help. So we always have people walking around and making sure that we can just check in and be like, hey, how's this going? What's it looking like? And it's just our way of making sure that everyone is included, especially if they don't want to speak up or if they feel like they can't really do something. We're always there just kind of walking around, making sure that we're checking up on them. Um, and I think that actually goes in with one of the questions that was asked on Twitch about how how do you build confidence when students might be shy or concerned about trying something new. Um, I think it definitely is important that you we don't call them out and we have a lot of our we have a lot of our kids that are in these shops so that we get like well one of the mentors to about two kids and that way when 
at a moment when like people are working around, you can go and do, be discreet and work out with them one-on-one. -on -one. If they're not really getting it or just don't really feel like asking for help, we can go and we can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and try to be positive and like inspiring and really get them into it so that they don't feel like they had a negative experience or they don't feel like no one was paying attention to them. Um, and our one of our other um, inclusion events that we do is um, Unified Robotics. So it's for, it's in partnership with Special Olympics. So it's for children with um, learning disabilities. We do, we got permission from the Ro Unified Robotics branch in Washington to start the first Unified Robotics in the Midwest uh, a couple, like two years ago. And so, um, recently, we've been doing it in the school, doing it with our special needs program within our school, but now we're planning on expanding it to our community. And I think that's that type of stepwise thing is really important, just because you need to do what you can do at that point, right? So we could definitely have tried to start within our community, but it would have been really hard for our team, especially as this was a completely new thing to us, and we wanted to make sure that we knew how to interact in a respectful way with the people around us and the people that we would be helping. Um, and I think that kind of relates to one of the other Twitch questions, which was, what recommendations do you have for a new slash rookie team? And it's do what you can and do it what you're comfortable with. Because if you reach for something that you can't handle, then you might end up doing a little bit more harm than good, especially if you hurt someone's feelings or something like that. So definitely like be inclusive, do your best, like reach out for it, but don't don't overwhelm yourself and do what you can. Um, yeah, going off of that, something that especially a newer team can do just to get out in their community and start this is just doing something as simple as like a demo, like taking your robot into somewhere public and having an event where someone can just go up like, hey, that's a robot, that's pretty cool. And you can have members there who can talk with either anyone, like their parent, a kid, anyone, and they can just drive around, they can see what it's like, and then you can engage with your community in that way. And you kind of build a rapport with your community then, and you can progressively like learn about what, who's in your community, how you can help grow STEM in your community, and then how you can progress into a more inclusive environment. So like, some of our events we've gone to like our intermediate school with one of our robots and we've just kind of like driven around kind of got kids interested and that way they can come into our robotics program but also they'll be able to we'll be able to contact them about any events that we might be hosting any of our workshops that we might be hosting later on so after so for all of these events um we, a lot of these events we end up doing curriculums for, or we kind of just like post the entire thing, planning it out, hosting it in our shop. So what we do to try to help more people and help a bigger like size and a bigger area of people is we have a website where we post all of the stuff that we do. So we post curriculums, we post guides on how to do some of the workshops, things like that. Um, and we've actually helped a lot of people. We have like a tracker that kind of tells who's accessing this and like where they're, where they're accessing it from. And so we've had about over 250 people in the last year from like all over the world, from like Singapore and China and Canada. And it's really amazing to know that we're having that impact. And it's also really good because people are able to teach themselves that way. And I think that's another major thing. You shouldn't do something that people aren't able to do by themselves, just because then it's not as impactful. And yeah, so they can't take it home with them, right? So like for, let's take our Girl Scout workshop. Um, while of course they can't keep our FLO robots because <laughs> those are pretty expensive, we do try to make sure that there's one aspect of it that they can kind of take home with them, whether it's like a business card so they can get in touch with us later or even like the robotic, like the prosthetic hands that they end up making at the workshop. Something that will 
last thing a little bit and also keep them thinking about what we had tried to tell them and how much fun that they had at these events so that they can explore it further when they have the time so like helping them make scratch accounts while they're there so they can go on scratch later and do it or leading them to websites like replit where they can continue their programming experience yeah, and especially currently with the current situation, we're starting to tailor some of our outreach events so that they can be done online. So as Anjali mentioned earlier, we're working on our Girl Scouts curriculum so that we can do it through something like a Zoom call and something that they can do by themselves. And it kind of ties into, we want to make sure that people have the ability to do this by themselves and that we are still there to help but it's still a curriculum that other people can get access to. And it's something that's very important for us to make sure that we don't necessarily have to be there to spread STEM in our community, that we can help plant the seed of STEM for other people. Um, and definitely with that, the whole like, um, so the reason that we actually started doing it is we were actually thinking about it before the whole situation started because what happened was a lot of people weren't able to travel to our shop directly, right? And so we wanted a way for them to still be able to experience them and to have a lot of fun with these activities, which is one of the reasons that we really started working on it. Um, I'm gonna really quickly share my screen and show a few of our photos of events so that you guys can kind of get a more hands-on, like this is what this looks like. So here, is one of our first events. So this is Deaf Kids Code. And so here we have a few Girl Scouts members who are just kind of testing out our robot and just admiring how it works. And we have like the very youngest member of Girl Scouts, which is a daisy in the blue. And then we have all the way up to the cadets, which is like middle school, high school age girls. So we're really catering for everyone in this. And you can kind of see that it was like a larger collaborative event that people could go with and interact with our robot there. Um, and then this was one of our minorities in engineering where they were doing their sumo bots. Um, so that's like the little disc Anjali was talking about earlier. And they have these Lego robots that they helped build appendages on and they helped to program so that they could kind of fight to see who could push each other off of this circle. And it was definitely something that was really eye-opening for a lot of members of our team to see and just help these other students work through. So this is the cybersecurity program that we had for our girl coders. So we had quite a few tables of girls with some 461 members around and they were messing with their Play-Doh to get all these different colors and just have their cybersecurity. And we made sure that we had at least one or two like members of our team there at a table with maybe like three or four girls there. And it was just so that we can help, we can make sure that they're all being engaged and make sure everyone is understanding. Here was our one of our Girl Scouts events. Um, you can kind of see the prosthetic hand over here. And they were like, they had just finished their prosthetic hand that they had to use to hold up a cup and move a cup. And they were just transitioning to using Scratch on their computers to do some basic programming. And lastly, here was our unified robotics competition that we had at our shop this past year. We have a board that is FLL style that we've designed ourselves with kind of FLL style game pieces. And we have it kind of set up as a mashup of all the first programs. We have it that there's a teleop period along with like an autonomous period that they can control the robot in two different ways so that they can learn about the different ways of programming. And it's not just all, okay, I'm gonna drive the robot. It's they have two different ways to think about things. And they've built the Lego robots themselves from scratch. We help them build like a five minute robot and then add on appendages so that they can perform everything. Um, I think to one of the Twitch questions that was asking, are there some resources, books, or videos that you have to share? Um, I would say just in general that doing the research beforehand is really important. Um, I don't think there's any like overall um, resources that would be beneficial, but it would definitely be 
very specific to what you were doing, right? Because like the way that you would organize a, an event for people with hearing disabilities is very different from the way that you would organize event for anyone with learning disabilities. So just making sure that you do the research beforehand and that maybe even like a little crash course with your team, depending on what you're doing about like, hey, how can you respectfully interact with the people that are going to come to our shop and the people that we're trying to help teach? Yeah, it is very important to know your audience especially if you have specific members who might not have engaged with a specific community before. So like when we went to Deaf Kids Code, we might have had some members who have never actually held like a conversation with someone with a hearing disability. And it's something that we want to make sure that people know to not be exclusionary when we go to those events. So we need to make sure that our team knows the proper ways to go about things. We want to make sure that everyone is included and that our team members are aware of including people make sure that our team members know how to look for someone who's kind of starting to close off on themselves. Because sometimes it is something that it's hard to see. Sometimes it's hard to just like look around a room and be like, oh, like, are they doing okay? Let's go check up on them. It's something that we need to make sure that everyone on our team is able to do, or most people are able to do that and make sure that our whole team is really like sympathetic towards people that we're being aware of our surroundings and that if a kid is getting overwhelmed or overloaded with something that we can work a way around it. Like if someone is being really overwhelmed because it's kind of noisy in a room, maybe just being able to take them aside and making sure that they're still learning, but that they're in an environment that they're comfortable learning in because it can be something that's very stressful. And if something's stressful, it's really hard to learn. So you need to make sure that you know the environment you're working in and that you're, the other people who are helping run a workshop or helping run a demo are aware of that because people don't all learn the same. It's something you kind of have to learn when you're doing workshops like these. Yeah, going alongside that, like, for example, something really like specific to Deaf Kids Code was that something that we don't normally have to do during demos is that we had to put up a really bright yellow warning sign that said that there was a robot um, that was in the area, right? Because even though we had our own like space sectioned off, if someone was hard of hearing and they ended up walking there, even if we asked for them to move or if a kid was driving it and um, they didn't know to stop, then someone could get hurt. So we knew that for that specific event, we needed to have like a space sectioned off with like something that was bright and very noticeable just in case something would happen. And that was something that we only had to do for that specific event because of the audience that would be at that event. So definitely like doing the research, making sure that you're taking proper precautions for whoever it is. And honestly, like the thing is about um, people closing off or people who might be shy or not have a lot of confidence or who might have a question but not really want to ask it it's not only in an inclusivity setting that it might happen but honestly just in general outreach like demos and stuff that that type of training and that type of like experience also helps out there because even in normal outreach um, settings where we're not actively looking at it like sometimes I'll notice that some kid looks like they really want to try the robot, but they're not coming up to us. And we can go over there and like give them the remote and it really tends to make their day. I think Chris is still muted and he hasn't realized yet. I haven't realized that I was <laughs> muted. That's okay. I have two different mute buttons and I must have pressed the wrong one. Um, thank you for all that information uh, and the conversation around um, inclusion. It is really important. And I think that um, you made some really good points uh, about taking the right steps. But I also like that, that you said, uh, just kind of rushing into it um, without, without doing proper preparation. <laughs> Um, you could uh, you could end up doing uh, harm, and so uh, and so you're right. But I do think that uh, hopefully anyway that that teams are taking the steps to be more inclusive. Hopefully, and maybe I don't know if this has been your experience, but sometimes you are going to make mistakes. But if you're making mistakes, you're you're doing something. 
Uh, and as long as you're, as long as you're willing to learn from those, right. Uh, and listen to the, um, listen to the audience that you're with um, because things change and, um, and we just have to understand that if we're going to adapt and, and be willing to listen to one another, that that is also uh, being inclusive, right? So I suppose don't be afraid to make a mistake uh, and, and just keep moving forward. So thank you so much. This is a really good topic. Um, and uh, I definitely think that, uh, you know, if you guys end up, I, I did share your team site uh, on the Twitch channel. Um, and so if there's other resources that you two come across, don't hesitate to, to get them to me. If you kind of come across some things that you all have done in the past that maybe is not on your website, we can certainly make those available on our website. So uh, very good. Well, now we're going to transition to our next topic. Uh, we're going to go from zero to hero. Uh, we're going to go from rookie to pro grammar with Addy from Team 6956, Shamrock Botics. Addie is going to join us here. There she is. Hi. OK. Welcome aboard. Uh, looking forward to the um, presentation on programming, uh, kind of that hero to zero, or zero to hero. Um, and so we'll let you take it away, Addie, and I'll watch the Twitch channel for any comments, OK? Okay. Okay. So as you know, my presentation is zero to hero, rookie to pro grammar. Um, so I really wanted to do this presentation because I started off on Shamrock Robotics SRB as a single programmer and really led its growth to what it is now. And I wanted to talk about how like steps that I've taken to grow it and how um, how other teams can uh, like use those same processes to grow themselves. So I'm gonna start at the very, so I put together a little agenda of the steps that I've put together. So first, where to start, where I'm gonna be talking about, um, first you need programmers to have a programming team and um, how to actually learn how to code for a robot. And next, choosing your programming language because there are multiple programming languages you can use and different frameworks that you can use to program your robot. Next, I have accessing programming resources because there are a plethora of resources that are available. Um, I'm just going, to be touching base on just a few of them and how to um, really read them. Uh, then from there, we wanna go above and beyond because at this, at this point, we'd only have the basics for programming and we wanna do better and learn new things. And last but not least, documentation, because it's extremely important that if you grow your programming team, um, technically that you don't start from zero each year. So you wanna document uh, what you've learned so that way you can go from there. So we're to start. So we wanna start with recruitment. Um, externally, uh, one of the few ways that I started was starting with a relationship with your programming teachers and schools so, you, so that you can advertise directly to programmers and programming classrooms or coding, or coding clubs, because these are people who obviously are already interested in programming. And so this can be a new opportunity for them and an opportunity for you to grow your team. Next, internally, uh, once you have these members, once you have, when you already have members, um, how to, um, how to advertise the programming team and really get them to join. Um, so one of the few like activities we've done was a human programming, uh, like really like a game where groups of students would write pseudocode to help a teammate complete an obstacle course. So this way they've learned, so they learned the processes to start developing and writing robot code without actually having to get into the nitty gritty. Also a paper plane, also paper planes demo. Um, 
which really does the same thing where teams build paper planes, write down instructions and passes, passes along. Um, these are demos that I've definitely borrowed from other teams and other programs, but they still work just as fine. Um, so yeah. And from there, you want to make sure that you actually learn how, how to code. So if you are completely new to programming, like no experience whatsoever, I highly, highly recommend and suggest Code Academy and W3 schools. Um, because even starting off in SRB, I didn't know Java. And um, during the preseason, it really helps to get the basics of learning how to use variables, how to use objects, um, super classes. Um, those are things that you use during the regular for regular FRC programming. And so having those basics down beforehand will really help your progression later on. So if you already have some basics down for programming and you just want to learn, get down to FRC specific programming, um, First, you can contact uh, nearby FRC teams. Um, for me, when we were starting, Carmel's team, FRC A68, was a huge help to us. Um, they came to like all of our preseason meetings to make sure that we knew what we were doing beforehand. And this really helps to boost confidence and it really allows you to start with your best foot forward rather than kind of blind like shoving your way through a dark room. Um, if you know there aren't any nearby FRC teams um, close to you, uh, you can. Uh, there are also like uh, many resources available online, um, such as the uh, many many teams publish YouTube channels uh, that really help to teach programming basics. So I would also suggest certain looking for those. Um, so languages and code structure. So um, first you want to, so choosing a language because there are four different languages that you can learn um, to program your FRC robot. So we have Java, C++, Python, and LabVIEW. Um, there are many different benefits for both. So if you already have a mentor, who's extremely, uh, excuse me, who has an extreme knowledge base in one of those, I would suggest um, jumping, going in, starting out with that. So that way you aren't so discouraged and so you already have something to begin with. Um, but if you don't have that pro mentor source, um, Java is a really good, is a really recommended source for new and experienced users because it is widely used in FRC, especially in Indiana. Um, it's also used in the AP Computer Science A exam. So if uh, helping students succeed in school is important to your team, which it should be, um, this is a really good uh, programming language to start with. We also have C++, which is also what widely used but it's not as common in Indiana as Java, but still pretty common, pretty prevalent. Um, but it also offers better high-end performance. And what that means is you'll be able to do, just do a little bit more um, with C++ than Java, but starting, but as you're starting out, it isn't something that you need to worry about right away. So, um, personally, I would recommend Java. We also have Python, which is extremely versatile, but unfortunately it isn't as um, backed as Java and C++ as it is a community rather than the official like first programming language, but still it's extremely versatile and um, a lot of professionals use it. So it's still uh, extremely helpful in the future. LabVIEW is another programming a source and it's native to the NI hardware as it's made by and it was created by NI for FRC programming. So it's really, it really goes hand in hand with the RoboRio. However, it's not a text-based programming language as much as it is a graphical based. 
So next you wanna, from there, you wanna choose a programming framework. And so once you have your, once you've decided on a language, uh, the next step is to learn what you want to program um, as a team. So there are really three main frameworks um, which are used in Java and C++. I know that Python and LabVIEW are a little bit different, but um, based on my experience, uh, I'm going to talk about these three. So, or, so the iterative robot is really simple. Um, it has, it uses an iterative robot based class that handles state transitions. For example, transitioning from the autonomous road, autom the autonomous mode of a robot to teleop disabled and then the test phase. Um, this can be really easy to use as a, as a rookie programming team since it doesn't use as many files and folders as the others can use, but year to year, it can get uh, really tricky as you start to learn more advanced um, programming techniques. And as you want to do more, the it can get really cluttered. So that brings us to the command-based robot, which is, act, which is a design pattern built on over the iterative iterative robot so it also uses so it can also handle state transits transitions um, but its design pattern is different in that if you make a robot code for this year um, most of it will you can still copy over for the next year and for the next year so um, it's a little bit better and it's used that way um, but this year they created a new command base and deprecated the old one, meaning that they wouldn't be creating any new programming classes for it. So for the new one, uh, commands and subsystems act as interfaces so that um, in them you're granted extra flexibility, which really allows you to do, uh, which then allows you if you're in Java, it allows you to use a little bit more advanced programming techniques and it allows you to abstract better. Um, and then in timed robot, time bot, it uses a timer to execute commands. It acts um, like the iterative robot, except it's completely time-based, which can get a little bit tricky later on. So I would, so between the three, um, we went with the command-based since we knew that we wanted something that we could use year after year and to continue to build our knowledge base upon. So command base is really good for that. Next, um, we want to learn how to access and utilize programming resources um, because you, because um, once you have your set programming language, and your set framework, um, you want to learn like what you can use to make your robot code better or what you can use to learn a little bit uh, more techniques so that you aren't stuck doing the same thing for multiple days, which can be a little bit rough. So um, some of the ones that I found were WPI Lib, which is the standard software library provided for teams um, to write code for their FRC robots. Um, it, has extreme, it has a lot of documentation for Java and C++, um, but it doesn't offer the same amount of documentation for um, LabVIEW, but it does offer some guides which can, if you if you choose to do LabVIEW, um, it can really help you along in the same process. Um, I've also linked, like all of these links are links to the resource that I'm talking about. So RobotPy, is the community-based um, software library um, for programming in Python. Um, again, it's, it's still just as reliable. However, it's created by a community and not officially by a source so that, um, so that it can be a little bit tricky to use at some point in times as like, as years go by, um, items do become deprecated. And so it can be, so you might may be forced to switch later on. 
And so for LabVIEW, they offer a PDF, um, which allow, which really runs through how to do things in a robot. Um, and then additionally, um, there's a read, read the docs guide created by a community of first mentors and students that really um, kind of walk you through the basics of how to do certain programming, advanced programming techniques, which I'm going to talk about right now. And so now that we've gotten to now that we've gotten to um, like the point where we have the basics of our robot code, we want to go above and beyond because that's what FIRST is all about. Um, so ad some advanced topics that you can start, begin to integrate. Um, so I've listed them out in the order that our team has used them. So that way, um, so as you're going on, you can kind of follow the same path. Um, so first we have sensors, which allow for the tracking and measurement of different robot subsystems. So for example, your drivetrain, if you want to measure the, the distance that it travels, um, there are certain sensors that you can use to do that. Um, those sensors, they're, you, I, I believe they're included in some of the kit of parts and they're readily available on AndyMark and other websites that I am sure are linked somewhere. Um, next, we have PID control, which is proportional, integral, and derivative, derivative loops that correct for error caused by sensors. So this can sound a little bit scary at first because it's calculus. However, like you, knowledge of calculus isn't required. I know that from personal experience. Um, basically, once you get to the point where you've used sensors, you realize that sometimes the sensors, they can, they can lead to over measurement or under measurement. Um, using PID controls, using PID loops, it allows you to make sure that your robot, it, their subsystems are functioning as accurately as possible. So next on the list, we have vision, which includes cameras and vision tracking. Um, you, the use of cameras is definitely pretty simple. Um, in, in Java, I know that they use only a single line of code. Um, so what cameras allow you to do is allows your drivers and your operators to see what your robot sees on the field. And so that can give you a an advantage while playing the game. Vision tracking is typically used for scoring points. Um, this or this year they were used along the outer loops and are you were used around the higher goal. So I know some teams use vision tracking to um, make sure their subsystems were accurate in their angles and uh, accurate in their scoring. And last on the list, I have packages. Uh, they're definitely something that is advanced, but not as hard to use. So that over the summer during your off seasons, it's very easy to um, integrate into robot code. Um, basically what they do is they organize classes and interface and interfaces to make it easier for year to year use. And basically this allows you to take um, code that you've used one year and bring it, bring it over for the next year. So that way you wouldn't have to use as much, um, as much time programming the same things over and over again, which can get a little bit um, frustrating at some times. Um, next, we have documentation, which is definitely 100% important um, because as I said before, you wanna make sure that all your information is being retained year to year so that in the future, um, you're not starting from zero every time the build season starts and you are starting from a point where you can begin to use um, new techniques. And as I said before, if you use uh, if you learn sensors one year, the next year you can use your sensors and build off of that and use PID control. So for documentation, um, something that we've used at SRB 
is Git and GitHub. So Git is the most widely used version control system and it allows for code collaboration, which means different users can, can, you, can access and can edit um, the same file without um, causing hidden conflicts because it will, it, it will tell you um, the changes made by a previous user and it will uh, log those. It will also log those changes, which is called version control so that in, in the future, if a mistake is made and you need to go back to a previous um, code, to a previous set of code that you know works best, um, that can be easily achieved using Git. So GitHub is a service, as it says, uh, is a service that hosts remote repositories for Git version control. And what this means is um, Git is native to your computer. So if you wanted to access your files from a different computer, it'd be a little bit tricky. So GitHub allows you to initialize your Git repo, known as your robot project folder, and, and send it to and allows it to be accessible from the internet so that you know so that if you have multiple students working on your programming team, um, different students will be allowed to work from home from within the robot, from your robot classrooms and even from comp from competitions. So that way um, so that way conflicts don't occur as much. And then last, I have Java Docs. Um, this is something that's specific to the Java programming language because it is called Java Docs. Um, so that it allows you to provide documentation while you program, which is very interesting because it's easier to have, it's easier to have, it's easier to accurately have up-to-date uh, documentation. So for example, if you wanted, if you were writing a class for your drivetrain again, and you wanted to say that a specific command, what a specific command does. So for instance, if we used our sensors um, to drive forward 10 inches, we can have, we can call that command drive forward 10 inches and our Java docs will, using Java docs, um, we can have it say, this command drives the robot forward 10 inches, uh, which is extremely easy, especially if you want to have year-to-year -year documentation to really log your, pro log your progress each year. And it really, it also allows um, other students who are reading your, who is reading your code to understand what everything is doing much easier. Um, it also generates HTML, HTML files for its documentation. So um, it's very, so when you pull it up on your workstation, it's very nice and very pretty laid out so that even if you're showing it to your parents, programming teachers, or even judges, it'll be extremely easy for them to follow along as you talk about all your hard work in progress. So that's it for my presentation. And I would like to uh, answer any questions from the Twitch chat. There are some. Yeah, Eddie, we did have a question. And again, Ed, this is more of kind of maybe a hardware question, but one was what kind of camera did you recommend uh, and what method for? What method for? Um, so a camera that we used was the standard USB camera because it was extremely easy because you just plug it into the Robo Rio. Um, and again, you use a single line of code. So it's easier for new teams to use it. Um, again, like there are different cameras for different reasons. Uh, so I know that there's an access camera, which uh, is able to take um, bigger pictures, but um, I wouldn't recommend against using cameras with fish that can distort your image because um, it, it really like confuses 
your drivers or operators, or if you're using vision tracking, it makes your data inaccurate. So a question from uh, me is, uh, what, and I've got, we've got another one on the Twitch is that, so you uh, were, I can't remember, a freshman or sophomore the very first year, a freshman? A freshman, yeah. Okay, so you were a freshman on a rookie team. Yeah. Uh, and were you always into programming? Um, I actually started programming the year before, but- okay. in, in a In a class or something, or did you yeah, in another in activity? Class. Yeah. Okay. So you came in with a little bit of experience mm -hmm. uh, programming. So that gave you a little bit more confidence maybe to um, to tackle some of the FRC. Was it a big leap for you still? Uh, definitely because it was, I was more used to web applications um, and programming for websites. Um, but again, like use the same process that I used is the same process that I presented which was um, to first like start off with the basics preseason. Um, Carl helped uh, like meeting with me to make sure that I got some more basics for FRC specific programming down. Um, then I also had an amazing mentor who had tons of FRC program, FRC Java experience. So it was really easy for, it was easier for me to like have the confidence to move forward. So you've gone from zero to hero uh, and you've established a programming team. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you teach new members programming? Uh, do you, have you had some students join Shamrock that have no programming experience? Uh, where do you start? Um, so if I can go back um, first, uh, something that we did was we uh, we dedicated a couple of days to like at the beginning when we we're recruiting members to the human programming so that they learn pseudo code so how to um, how to really plan what you're going to program um, from there uh, we gave like like small homework assignments of like um, going to Code Academy or W three schools to like learn how to use um, variables or, or like printing hello world. Um, then for the rest of the season, um, I, I teach them uh, how to program our, our practice robot, our little drivetrain. So, um, so I lead the discussion about that and then I, I let them program it later on. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that I think that lays out a good, yeah, a good course for uh, going from zero to uh, getting some, definitely some more experience. Uh, there is another question. Um, what adv would you advise against using a DSL? A DSL. I don't know. So if we don't know the answer to that, we can maybe yeah. float that out to the community and <laughs> and let the, let the community answer that one. Uh, so what's one of your favorite kind of go-to sources? Maybe mentor not right there. Maybe you're stuck on something. Do you kind of have a favorite source if it's a, a community-based or a web-based? Yeah. So um, since we use Java, um, I really... I spent probably at least hundreds of hours use, uh, reading through WPI Live, um, but also um, it really helps you like give, it really helps you give by giving you, um, telling you what command, what commands you can use are, um, what they do since it's a documentation, but also the read the docs it's also it's also extremely helpful because be, it goes beyond that by giving you in-depth wordy exp explanations of what things do so that you can kind of understand what they um what it does beyond just that single line of saying this drives 10 inches okay well, and I think one of the things I really appreciated about what you talked about at the start uh, is one thing that I definitely um, 
advise teams to do all the time is to reach out to other teams. Uh, you gave a great example of how a, a neighboring team, FR868, uh, came over and helped you in your, your preseason. And I know I'll, they, I know there were some students or other folks who came out during your, your first uh, rookie build here uh, to help you out. And that's one of the great things about FIRST is that uh, teams like to help teams. And so when in doubt, um, put the question out there. There's, there are some uh, forums uh, for mm -hmm. discussion but also just even reaching out to a, a nearby team. So uh, Addie, thank you so much for this, um, uh, this presentation this evening. I uh, appreciate you being on. Uh, some good stuff here. I did put the links from your presentation uh, onto the Twitch chat. I'll also, um, if you send that to me, that presentation to me via email, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and get that onto our uh, website. Mm -hmm. For sure. So people can go back and, and watch it from there. So thank you very much. No problem. All right. Well, we're going to transition to our final uh, session, show, segment, whatever we call these uh, for the evening. Uh, our final session is um, one that uh, is timely for us because it's, it's something that here first Indiana Robotics uh, and many of our teams, we've been working on uh, legislative advocacy, um, still kind of in the early days, really, of, of um, as an organization and as a statewide group of, of teams, um, kind of in the early phases of, of the process. But yeah, so the topic is legislative advocacy, really just kind of a 101. Um, and Devin, uh, one of our uh, student board of director members, uh, Devin, a senior, graduating and will be attending the University of Evansville in the fall. She is a purple ace come this fall. Uh, Devin will be uh, leading the conversation. Uh, Devin, I'll let you take it from here and you can uh, let our guests introduce themselves. And Awesome, thank yep. you. And I'll watch for questions and I'll probably have a few of my own. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, yes, so I am going to be attending the University of Evansville. I'm going to be majoring in communications and minoring in political science. So I am really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'm just so interested in advocacy work after attending the National Advocacy Conference in DC last summer. And I just really hope that those listening today will learn how we can effectively make our voices heard so our representatives can just learn how powerful and impactful this robotics program is. So thank you to our panelists for being with us today. Um, would you mind just taking a moment to introduce yourselves to our first Indiana Robotics family? And since many of our students are thinking about, you know, college majors and career paths, maybe you can also share what you studied in college that may have put you on the path you are on now. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, sorry, and I apologize. I am uh, still trying to find this like right angle for uh, web <laughs> webcasting. I've been all over the place trying to find uh, the right one. I think I have um, Harry Potter books two, four, and seven currently stacked up to try to get like this. <laughs> they're the right lengths. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Devin, for having us. Uh, my name is Ben Grove, and uh, I work with Terry Maxwell, who serves as Director of Engagement for uh, FIRST Headquarters. Uh, I work for Thompson Coburn. We're a DC-based law firm. And for the last seven years, um, I have uh, been working with FIRST for their federal advocacy and lately really getting into state advocacy. Um, I graduated from the University of Florida. I'm a proud Gator. Um, I actually wanted to be an astronaut when I was in middle school and we did not have a FIRST team. Um, so unfortunately, my, 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 um, at, uh, my civics teacher got me on this track of campaigns and I kind of went that direction, but I've always loved robots. Um, I had the mind storms when it first came out a long, long time ago. Um, kind of a fun story before I hand it off. Um, we, uh, I just found out that my middle school replaced one of their agriculture classes with the first uh, tech challenge team. So uh, I'm, I'm excited that the next generation is going to get the opportunity. Oh, that's super exciting. We're always looking to grow our program, right? <laughs> um, but who would like to go next? 
Sure, I'll jump in. My name is Steve Heyer. Um, I started as a mentor with FIRST um, more than 10 years ago now and uh, worked my way doing chairman's kind of stuff. So it was very interesting listening to the uh, programming uh, component that was right before this session because um, it's largely Greek to me. Uh, we won a world championship chairman's award and I kind of worked myself into judging after that. And as a local school board member, I've been um, doing advocacy work for the last 20 years or so. And I've led parents and students and teachers and administrators and board members um, going to Washington doing advocacy. I've been to a lot of our uh, state capitals doing first work with kids engaging in advocacy and, and trying to get them fired up about democracy and, and kind of a weird, uh, weird political environment that we've been in these last few years. Um, here. My uh, degree is biology from the University of Michigan, and my day job is a, a web software development company, um, which uh, has very little to do with my degree, except um, one of my biggest clients uh, collects COVID data and aggregates that and runs research on it. And so I have not been probably busier than I've ever been in my life these last uh, two months here working on that. And finally, after uh, 20 years, putting my biology degree to work a little bit, um, I actually know what they're talking about. So uh, that helps in uh, my day job all in all, but uh, very excited for FIRST. Um, we do a lot of advocacy work um, with a, a team of volunteers and uh, do some chairman's boot camps and judge advise um, all over the world. Um, it's a great organization, great to be part of it. Thanks for uh, having me virtually in Indiana from my home in Michigan. Go Blue, by the way, Ben. Okay, I'll go next. My name is Frank Ferrari and I'm a member of the NAC staff and I've been putting together NAC for the last three years now. The two years prior to that, I attended the conference uh, as a member of 1718, the Fighting Pie out of Armada, Michigan. Uh, I'm currently a junior. Well, I just finished my junior year at the University of Michigan, where I majored in molecular biology with a minor in business. And uh, yeah, I've had a lot of fun working on advocacy these last couple of years. And then as a senior in high school, I took that my experiences at NAC and applied it to start the Michigan Advocacy Conference. And since then, I've been helping Steve organize NAC. My turn. Um, my name is Veronica Schilb, and I am an associate attorney at Barnes and Thornburg, which is a um, law firm here, based here in Indianapolis. Um, at Barnes, I do public finance and um, bond work, but I also am a registered lobbyist with the state of Indiana. So we represent all kinds of organizations from like publicly traded companies to um, nonprofits to professional associations. So it's really fun to get to work with a variety of different clients and then advocate for their needs um, with the General Assembly. And then we also do, I do a little bit of executive branch lobbying too. So working with state agencies or um, the governor's office and, um, you know, representing our clients for their kind of regulatory needs. Um, before I was at Barnes, I worked in the governor's office for six years. So I worked for governors um, Daniels, Pence, and Holcomb. So I was part of their legislative teams, um, which is Kind of similar to being a lobbyist so we're just representing the governor's interests before the general assembly so i have a lot of um, experience so far in my professional career i guess in, in lobbying the indiana general assembly um, i graduated from manchester college in kind of northern indiana um, with a political science degree so that definitely played into i guess what i'm doing now we are very excited to have you all here with us today so thank you for joining us um, but to get started, I guess my first question is for teams who want to start forming a relationship with their representative, how often do you, you recommend that they start reaching out? So I'll jump in. Um, I think it, it, it really depends on the, the person you're reaching out to, and it depends on the team. It depends on your proximity. Um, what you don't want to do, we, we always say don't become pen pals. You know, they, they don't want to hear from you all the time on every little thing. That is, that is not how this process works. You know, step one is develop a relationship. That means sitting down, they get to know your story and what you're all about. You know, step two is make them a fan at first. And that's not hard. That, that's probably the easiest part of the, this whole advocacy piece is tell your story. 
you know, tell them why you're excited, why you're passionate about it, what you got out of it, what, what kind of a kid you were like before, what kind of a kid you are now, what your future plans are, how it's driven you. I mean, we have a lot of great data uh, around FIRST and its success, but your personal passion for it is really what kind of sells. And I think, you know, largely I would say from a state perspective, you know, state budgets typically work annually, at least annually. Um, however, you know, depending on your community, you might have a parade, you might have coffee hours, you might invite somebody um, into your build space or to a competition. So, I mean, all of those are great touch points and there's no real set frequency, um, but I would say at least annually and don't, don't think they remember you, always tell, tell them who you are and where you're from and what your story is. Um, and that's how you really develop that relationship. Yeah, I would um, definitely echo what Steve said, especially the last comment about they may not remember, they may remember you or your organization after some point, but I can tell you I've met with some of them like 50 times and every time it's like the first time. So don't take that personally if that happens to you. Um, and definitely I think the legis like if you're reaching out to legislators, they'll be excited to hear from you. Um, and so if you can make it a meaningful experience for them, I know we're living in kind of weird times. So who knows when you'll have your next like event you could invite them to or something like that. Um, but getting them out to see what you're doing, I think they'll be so impressed and they'll be um, excited, you know, really excited about it. So don't be afraid to do that. And I would echo too what Veronica said, like a lot of the elected officials are, are trained at pretending they know you even when they don't. So, you know, it's like, a, I mean, they might get a crib sheet that says met with them last year. So they might say, good to see you again, because like that's how their office works and they're well organized and that's great. Doesn't mean they remember you. So don't assume that because they said, good to see you again, that they remember anything you've previously told them because they might be having meetings all day, every day, every 15 minutes. Um, and you can imagine what kind of uh, overload that is. And I would say too, a lot of electeds, when they see kids, they think photo op, right? So they're like, hey, gather around, let's take a picture. So if, if you have things you actually want to address, that catches them off guard a little bit. And that's where they, I think they really do get interested because a lot of times kids are better prepared than adults who refuse to practice and refuse to be prepared and think they can just wing it. And, and this is usually an intimidating environment that you don't want to wing. You actually want to be prepared. The only thing I would add, uh, just building on what Veronica and Steve both said, is that um, it is a really weird time right now. And, and unfortunately, we had to cancel the season. And um, so, and that's been always our best opportunity to get elected officials to come see exactly what FIRST is and to see FIRST in person. Um, but what has really struck me recently is the amazing outpouring from first teams uh, in the relief efforts related to the pandemic. And this is something that I think really echoes with elected officials right now. Um, these, these stories, uh, I actually had a, a, was talking to a team um, in Illinois a couple of weeks ago, and they're currently making belt buckles, the buckles to the PPE to um, make the mask more comfortable. And they're putting out like 2,000, 3,000 of these I was in a conversation with a lawmaker and just casually mentioned, hey, this is what your team is doing, and they're already connected with them. So this is a great time and kind of a really weird situation to just, if you've already made contact with a lawmaker, just say like, hey, just FYI, this is what this team is doing right now. Absolutely. I, I think that I love hearing those stories about what teams are doing despite all of the COVID drama. And I think, and I do remember uh, Mr. Heyer at NAC last year, how that was always like the number one rule was like build the relationship and everything like that. So I think that's definitely good advice for our teams to hear. Um, but my next question is when planning a meeting, is it best to um, limit the number of students who attend? Cause I know our, our FRC teams especially can get pretty big. Um, and if so, what would be a good limit of team members and mentors to set? All right, I'll jump in because nobody else unmuted. Um, you, you know, I think the, these are your meetings. And I think there's a there's sort of a human reasonableness to how many people can be effective in a meeting. Um, but that doesn't mean you need to limit the meeting to just a few people. You know, so depending on where you are and the size of the office and the size of the meeting space, like, you know, don't bring 110 people and try to cram them into an office without making some sort of pre-arrangements with the office of how many people are coming. 
you know, if, if it's 20 and, and you expect four or five people to actually participate in the meeting and gather around and everybody else can kind of observe, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I think flexibility is key and, and I'll probably mention that a few more times. You just, you have to roll with it, however the environment, whatever's going on. You know, if there's a, a staff member starts the meeting, the elected official comes in, they might spend a few minutes, you know, don't, do you restart? Do you not restart? Where do you pick up? Where do you, where do you go? You just have to be prepared for every circumstance. The bells go off, there's a vote, um, you know, they're knocking on the door, time's up, you know, just, you've gotta be prepared for all those circumstances. That's why I think um, kids make better advocates because they will prepare and be ready for that and don't let them off the hook. Some offices are really, nitpicky and they're like we only have space for four people and, and i would say very respectfully you know we are your constituents and and we'd like to schedule this meeting and and you know let's let's make arrangements you know if we have to stand in the hall we can put the four people who are going to talk to you up front and and you know the rest of the people standing behind but you know we 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 want to have this meeting and, and i think being polite and professional is part of that it's not an adversarial process by any means uh, it shouldn't be at least uh, but definitely, I think that the size is a lot up to the teams and just really reasonableness of, of what makes sense, given, you know, where you're meeting. If somebody's coming to your build space, by all means, you know, have all 100 people there if you have a large team, you know, and, and allow them to, to meet as many kids as possible and give as many kids an active role, you know, just kind of roll with it and be flexible. To kind of build off that. Uh, over the last couple of years at NAC, we've had some large state delegations trying to meet with their senators. And one of the things we propose is just letting them know approximately how many people you're going to have going and asking if you could get a larger meeting room. And like Steve was saying, you just have to be flexible in the space that they're going to give you and how many people you can reasonably fit in there. I would just add setting the expectations ahead of time with the legislator elected official or their staff really is probably who you'd be setting the meeting with um, will be helpful. So they'll be able to tell you, you know, we're going to have a meeting in their office. So it's kind of limited to this. But if you want to have a dozen people there, you can make arrangements ahead of time, like you said, to have the meeting in a hallway. It's really, um, you know, you can make the best of whatever the situation is, but just communicating that ahead of time will probably accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish. Excellent. Um, I think that's that's a very good thing for our teams to know because like the our, our FRC teams can get very, very large. And I think I, I really like um, what you said, Mr. Heyer, about being, you know, um, professional and polite and like blending those together while, while still like getting your point across. So I think that's very great for our teams to hear. Um, but my next question, when you make an appointment, how likely is it that you will actually meet with your representative or is it more typical that you would see their staff and do you prepare any differently for either scenario? I don't know, Ms. Veronica, if you might be a good person to start us off with this one since you've- Yeah, I think if, I would say here, if you wanna meet with your legislator, it's very likely that that's who you're gonna meet with. Um, their staff may attend or they may have an intern attend, especially if it's like during session, which happens here from January through March or April, depending on whether it's a budget year or not. Next year is a budget year, so they'll be meeting through April. Um, but absolutely, you'll meet with, you'll, I, I don't know why you wouldn't meet with your legislator. Um, and then you also have the opportunity to, you know, if you have a scheduled meeting, that's one thing. But um, you can also go to the state house and anybody can request their legislator to come out in the hallway and you can talk to them that way too, which is usually quicker and it's a little more, um, you know, you have to get your point across quickly, but that's how a lot of um, lobbying is done too, in addition to like having formal set meetings. I would add that you, you won't get something that you don't ask for. So I, I always recommend that you go for a member level meeting. Um, uh, elected officials love to see their constituents, uh, especially if it's a, uh, if they're back home in the district, uh, I think you're more likely to get an, uh, an actual congressional me meeting with your member of Congress. Senators less likely, um, but you still a chance. Um, the other thing that I recommend is that many members of Congress have, and even the senators have a specific day of the week that they host a breakfast or it's, it's North Carolina where I actually went to high school does a uh, Krispy Kreme Tuesday or something. And their two senators come every single time to meet with their constituents. So if you're coming to DC outside of something like NAC, 
um, check to see when that day might be for the Indiana members and see if you can make it because that's a great easy opportunity for you to get in front of both your senators. I would add on the the basis of the relationship that you form really affects who you get in that meeting as well because every office typically has some kind of chart and it's like if this person calls this is who we want to connect them with so the more um, they're used to dealing with you and your level of professionalism the easier it's going to be to get a member and and part of that depends on uh, whether the, the body is in session or not so if you go to Washington in a recess week, like you're not meeting with a member, you can have a staff level meeting and that's equally important uh, because the staff will brief the elected official. Um, but you know, in some cases it's easier to meet back in the district. You know, the state will, will have the same kind of schedule where there's recess periods, where there's work, they're actually in session. So you're, you're more likely to get somebody. So knowing that really helps as well. But if you schedule a 30 minute meeting, I mean, you wanna be respectful that it's a 30 minute meeting and you know, especially the higher level folks that, that I bring, especially kids in to meet with, some of them, you know, if we're meeting with, with Secretary Betsy DeVos, um, you know, and she's scheduled 20 minutes for us, you know, before the meeting, I'm telling everybody, all right, at 18 minutes, we're standing up and we're, we're saying thank you and we're starting to walk out, not rudely, but, you know, I want them to know when I request a meeting the next time that we are going to be respectful of their time and I want them to schedule the meeting next time. So if we're sitting there at 30 minutes and she's got another thing to get to, we're not ever getting another meeting. Um, so that part of that is, is kind of knowing, knowing the ropes and, and how, to, how to kind of play your role. Now, granted, if they tell you 30 minutes and they're rushing somebody out at 15, you can certainly overstay your welcome to the time you have scheduled. But, you know, be, be polite and professional at all times. Again, it's about that relationship and leveraging the relationship to get the member, whether it's on the phone um, or in person, I think is definitely something you can do. All right, very good. I like Mr. Grove that you brought up like those um, meetings with the two senators. I actually, when I was in Washington DC last summer, I went to our Hoosier huddle is what they call it for the Indiana representatives. So that was very cool to get to meet the senators and also talk to some of their staff members about you know, the program that I love so much. So um, are there certain times of the year though that are better than others for when scheduling appointments with legislators? Um, I would say at the state level, if you're wanting to, you know, invite them to an event um, or something in the district, then it's better to do it outside of when session happens. So, you know, late, I guess, beginning in May through the end of the year would be a good time for, those sorts of visits um, to let them know, you know, see your program firsthand, get to know you. And then if you're looking to advocate for something legislatively, like if there's a first bill or you have a budget proposal, um, then those meetings would be better to have kind of in the fall. Um, and then once session starts in January. I would add for the federal level um, that you just have to stay away from the uh, Congress is in session um, almost year round. Um, the big exception is August every single year. Uh, they go out for a month. Uh, that dates back to when DC was a legitimate swamp and people wanted to go back home to where it was cooler. So they get out of town. Um, they also typically leave uh, in October of election years. So Congress will be out of session. Uh, I guess things have now been completely thrown out the window, so maybe, but they're expected to be out of session in October, leading up to the presidential and congressional elections. Uh, the, I would actually get a little bit more specific in that if you're coming to DC, I would avoid Mondays and Fridays uh, in kind of a very typical DC thing. Um, members of Congress come in for votes on Monday night, uh, and then the jet, fl jet fumes uh, start on Thursday afternoon um, when they are trying to get back home. Uh, and so uh, I generally try, especially when I'm working with FIRST or with my clients, to get meetings on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays if you're trying to get member level meetings. If you're trying to get staff level meetings, uh, Mondays and Fridays actually work out a little bit better because their bosses aren't around. Yeah, I think flexibility there is really key. And um, sometimes if you're, if you're doing meetings and you have two days, it's a little easier to work with their schedule if you say, hey, do you have any time on Tuesday or Wednesday? Whereas if you say, you know, hey, I'm in town Tuesday, do you have a meeting time available between 12 and one? Like you're less likely to get fit into the schedule. 
that makes sense. You just have to respect respect their time as much as possible. It, um, and I guess I would I would add one more thing, Devin, that do you ask what time of year? And I think it probably depends what you're trying to affect. You know, so if you're trying to affect a, a budget allocation, certainly right after they pass the budget is not the time to go. Um, you know, probably early on, if there's committee work being done on the budget, if budget bills are being introduced, depending on how the state or the, the, the feds are doing it that particular time, you know, you, you've got to look at what, what that is. If you're trying to affect a reauthorization, you know, before it gets to that committee level, if there's a hearing, you know, just looking at what's going on and what might, what might have impact based on what you want to talk about, that would really help. Now, there's no bad time to develop a relationship to make them fans at first. Um, the, the only time that makes it better or worse depends on the specific ask that you may have. And I think you'd work up to that. If you're a new advocate, that might be your second or third meeting by the time you get to that. If you're a veteran advocate like you are, you might hit them with the first meeting. You're ready to, to bring something like that up. Awesome. Well, since you brought up um, new advocates, um, where does a team that has never done this before start? Like how would a team go about inviting a legislator to their shop or to their school? Um, would they use like a handwritten letter, a phone call, an email? What would you, what would you recommend? Um, <laughs> uh, I would think an email, uh, email is probably the best. Um, I generally advise, especially uh, at least at the federal level uh, against any type of snail mail. Um, it goes to an offsite facility um, that then gets processed and it takes like two weeks for a member of Congress to get a, an actual email, or excuse me, an actual piece of mail. Um, phone calls just get kind of lost. Um, I would check either the member of Congress's website. Oftentimes they have a, uh, a, a Google form essentially to allow you to uh, fill out the, the, the information. Um, the second thing is to, um, uh, in the same place, uh, look for the scheduler's information and uh, you can go from there and request a, a meeting with your member. You can Google a lot of times who you wanna meet with and, and their scheduling contact and, and try to find an email address that way. I mean, obviously, um, you know, with, with an organized lobby day or fly-in day, like with NAC, we're providing contact information. Um, with Ben's help actually of, of, you know, who the right people are to schedule that meeting with, you know, locally, it, it, it could be a case of looking on the website, filling the form out, um, Googling, when all else fails, you could call and say, can I have your schedules, scheduler's contact information, please? Um, and they'll very likely give you an email address, but uh, email tends to work best. It's easy to follow up. You have a trail, you can cover all the fine details. You can include a video link or something. If you if you'd like um, in the in the confirmation stage of that, um, you get more, way more flexibility. I feel like. I guess just to follow up on that, if you're trying to do something at a set date, like we do in NAC, or if you have like a state advocacy day, you might want to email the first couple times, and as you get closer to the event, you may want to call the office and try and get in contact with the scheduler to make sure you can get that meeting set for the day you are there. And every office does it different, and every office will frustrate you in a different way. Um, sometimes you're just on their timetable. Sometimes you have the most frustrating individual on the planet that you're working with. Um, you know, I, I took a group of school board members in February, uh, the beginning of February. It just so happened that our main meeting day was the State of the Union Day. There weren't any members there. We had all our member level meetings on that Wednesday. We did all staff level meetings on, on that Tuesday. It was just, we had to roll with it and be flexible. Uh, because of that, you know, there's one congressperson that I was trying to schedule a meeting with. It, it, she represents a little part of my school district. It couldn't have been a more frustrating experience going back and forth a hundred times. Ultimately, they got the message that, you know, I, we, we had the meeting and we had a member level meeting. Uh, but persistence in that case absolutely paid off. And, and sometimes that's what it takes. Um, and and when you're, you're dealing with students, the, the sort of... Uh, ace in the hole is to really play on the students are really looking forward to this meeting you know the students are you know set on this the students have finalized their schedule like play if you and if you're a student and scheduling the meeting um, by all means just say myself and my fellow students really play on that because that that obviously your your constituents and and they want to uh, um, they want to meet with you in that case and they want to know you're serious 
Um, but sometimes it seems like offices may be on the first one and, and you, might, you might have sent it too early. You can't schedule really a month out. A month out or more is like, they don't know what their schedule is. So, you know, they might say, thank you. We'll get back to you closer too. But as you get inside kind of that two week window, you have to start really being persistent. I agree with Steve that that kind of two week window is kind of the sweet spot of getting meetings. Um, and oftentimes uh, offices at the federal level aren't really booking meetings. They're not figuring out the congressman, uh, congresswoman schedule till the week before Thursday, Friday or so. So you may not actually get a final answer, um, but as long as you just stay on their radar, do not feel like you don't can't just say, hey guys, are we still in the queue? Are we getting a decline? Um, but do expect that sometimes schedulers come to get schedules come together later than you kind of wish and or hope that they would. I'll just um, would say for members of the General Assembly, I think the best approach is probably to email their state house account, which you can I think you can find for all of them online. But if it's, you know, Senator from District 39, his email is s39 at iga.in.gov. They're all the same. Um, and then copying their legislative assistant. And you can find those names also on the General Assembly's website, because um, typically for most legislators, their legislative assistant will handle scheduling requests. Um, you just have to keep in mind that your each legislative assistant has a caseload of four or so legislators. So they're manage, they are managing a lot. Um, so you should feel comfortable to follow up with them if you need to, you know, try and give them as much ahead much of a heads up um, if you are requesting a specific meeting date as possible. Um, and then I would say also after you do have the meeting, I think like a handwritten thank you note always does go, does go a long way. So that may be a more appropriate time um, for something handwritten just so then you're not dealing with the time sensitivity either. And, and just keep in mind that these people you're dealing with are used to getting yelled at all the time by a variety of different people on every possible issue and if you spend any time in an office the phone will ring and you know i've just i felt so bad standing there waiting for my meeting and i can just imagine what the person on the other end of the phone is saying but it's obviously that these people are getting reamed out so the the more pleasant you can be the more you can thank them and appreciate them um the the farther you're going to get and and the relationship certainly matters with an elected official but it starts with the receptionist, the scheduler, the assistant, any level of staff as well. You all want them to have a positive view. You all want them to be fans at first. Um, you want them to be um, excited, you know, next time you, you, you come in. Awesome. I think that's a lot of great information because we are, we are very excited to get um, more involved in advocacy work in Indiana, um, but we are still really working on building up our resources and getting our teams involved. So I think that's a lot of great information for those of us who are still new to advocacy work. Um, but okay, I remember when I attended NAC last summer, uh, we were advised that it could sometimes be necessary to redirect the conversation back to the topics we were there to discuss because sometimes our representatives could have other issues that they might prefer to discuss. So can you maybe share some tips that could help our students to better prepare for this challenge? Sure. <laughs> I didn't see Ben jumping in, so I'll jump in. Ben, you can, you can back clean up. And Frank, you've seen a couple things to uh, uh, jump in on, but I mean, Sometimes you'll have every diversionary tactic in one meeting all at the same time, and other times it's just absolutely the best uh, meeting you could possibly you could possibly have. And so, you know, certainly you go in, they're not expecting you to have any real ask or any real substance to the meeting, and they want to take a photo and, you know, oh, kids, great, and Senator, great, you know, let's, let's, you know, uh, stand next to each other professionally and take a picture and call it a day. It's my easiest meeting of the day. And when you say, actually, Senator, we have some things we wanted to talk to you about. Um, the tenor changes a little bit. You have an agenda you want to run through. Um, you say, hey, you know, first is a great program. You know, it, it's based on a game coming out. And, you know, we build a robot, we compete. I started, I didn't know anything about programming, but now I'm an expert programmer. And uh, she says, well, actually, I sponsored a bill to expand programming access for, you know, K-12 schools. And it's the greatest thing in the world. And she starts talking about 
you know, something that, that she's promoted or wanted to do, maybe asks you to support that effort. Um, and all of a sudden you're like, well, wait a minute, we are here to talk about our experiences in, in first. And generally when you're talking about your personal experiences, that's not usually where the conversation veers off. Um, but sometimes you get people that are a little more long-winded. Um, I mean, if you have a 15 or 20 minute meeting with a member of Congress, you might have a little longer with a, a, a state senator or, or state assembly member. Um, you know, it, just, it depends on what's going on and, and what the day is. I mean, if they're at your build space, you might have an hour um, based on their scheduled time um, with you. But you, you definitely want to keep in mind that you know, the, the outline that you come up with, which, you know, prepare, practice, also be flexible, but the outline you come up with and the points that you want to cover, you, you, you want to stick to it. You know, if, if the, the senator, the, the, the elected official gets off on a tangent and starts, you know, talking too much about, you know, what they have going on, by all means, wrestle it back. You know, if you say, hey, for an investment in FIRST is going to pay dividends, you know, we need more access to first in areas that don't have first. We're fortunate, we have access, I'm on a first team, but there are there are inner city areas that don't have access. We need to expand that access. You know, we're here to, to promote that. Um, you know, look at some of the examples in states that have it. We need that in our state of, of how the state has helped grow this program to prepare more workers. Um, you might get an objection. You know, in the case of objection, I mean, right now, um, um, you know, the, the Congress can't print money fast enough. Um, the, the, the Federal Reserve, I guess, can't print the money fast enough. Um, so it, you may get some debt objections, right? Hey, we've just spent $3 trillion we didn't have. How could we possibly spend more money on, on FIRST or education? And, and, and how, how you object to that is, you know, you have to, you have to be ready for that. You know, you're gonna, they're gonna might ask you, well, where do we cut? Where do we get that money? You know, and you have to be ready to say, you know, it's your job, we elected you, it's your job to decide which programs are effective and which programs might not be effective. I'm telling you that the program we're here for is an effective program and has great results and is gonna pay dividends in the future. You know, it's your job to do that evaluation. And so there's ways to very professionally and politely, I think, push back a little bit and keep things on track. And I would add just from my own personal experience, I, I think that any attempts that come off as diversionary oftentimes are more of the staffer trying to engage in the conversation. Uh, I think when you go to the Hill, uh, when you go to, whether it's the, the, the State House or Congress, you're going to find very different levels of experience among staffers. Often they're in their 20s, and, uh, and, and to a lot of, I, I bring along, around a lot of older folks, and they go in these meetings with 20 year olds, and they're like, oh, they're making policy. So they talk down to them, but they're the ones actually making policy for the members of Congress. But what I've really found is that staffers are just so engaged on so many issues. Uh, you have the education staffer who is also doing healthcare and um, defense and uh, agriculture issues. And you, you really get this, some staffers are love education and they can talk about it and they can talk about workforce development. And some really just don't, that's not their area of expertise and they were just given the education portfolio. So my, my recommendation is to go into every meeting like this staffer knows nothing about FIRST, knows nothing about STEM education, knows nothing about what we're doing to prepare the next generation of workforce. And this is sort of what we're really starting to engage on is this idea that FIRST is training the 21st century workforce, uh, less kind of the emphasis on STEM and more really this like labor, um, we, are, we are creating the next workforce. So that's something that I think is just start from the beginning, assume every staffer knows zero about FIRST, um, and remember that FIRST has always been bipartisan. Uh, we're not a partisan issue. Uh, we have Democratic supporters, we have Republican supporters, uh, and that's really been a blessing for us. Um, so that's kind of my recommendation, L less on diversionary and just, just engage with the conversation with the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with the staffer. And I mean, if they suggest their bill, say, hey, we'll look into it and send it over our way and we'll take a look at it. And then I guess just to follow up is, being that students don't have a ton of uh, experience in this department, they might throw out some bill or legislation that you don't know about and you don't really know how that uh, affects what you're trying to talk about. And I think it can get overwhelming for people who are in their first meeting. So just try and steer it back into what 
you're there to talk about and make sure that they understand that that's why you're there. Um, I have a couple of follow-up comments to the comments that have already been made, but to that last point, you know, if they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, it's okay to say you don't know. We'll look into that. We'll get back to you um, being like truthful and honest is the most important thing that you can do. So don't try and make something up. Um, and then I also wanted to add to what Steve said about, you know, you may get pushback, especially um, if you're making a budget request. I know the Indiana budget session next year is going to be really, really, really tough. Um, so if you're, you know, advocating for something and it doesn't pass or you don't get everything you want, that's okay. Um, there's plenty of great ideas that have taken years and years to get past. It doesn't always happen on the first time, but what you're doing is so important because you're laying the groundwork for the next group of first students who are then going to come and ask, make the same ask the next year, the next year until, you know, it eventually gets accomplished, hopefully. So um, like see yourself as planning an important seed if nothing else happens from it. You know, you're building those relationships and raising awareness of your organization. Um, and then a couple tips that I thought of in terms of keeping the meeting on track. Um, the legislators are very well-meaning, but they're also like very gifted in talking and talking about themselves and they'll be really interested in you. Um, so I think if you have kind of those relationship building conversations outside of the times that you're trying to actually advocate for something, that could be helpful. Um, because then when you're doing the ad, actual like advocacy work on a specific piece of legislation, you may not get as derailed into conversations about you and where you go to school and those sort of things. Um, and then set expectations about the purpose of the meeting before the meeting. So when you reach out to their assistant to schedule the meeting, let them know we're here to talk about Senate bill this or house bill this. Um, so they know that you're there for a specific purpose. And then a lot of times we like to use handouts, so like a one pager on what the bill is or whatever you're there to talk about. Um, Cause I think that can kind of help keep you on track. And then if the conversation does get derailed and you don't get to all your points, they have a quick reference as to what you wanted to communicate to them. Or even if you do cover it, then they can go back to that and remember what the conversation was about. And, and keep in mind from their perspective, they are doing meetings typically all day, every day, and it's their job not to commit to something. And so the more you ask them to commit to something, the more they're going to try to, and, and I, I, I don't mean this negatively, but they're weaseling out of it to some extent, because it's easier to not commit than to commit to something, right? So if you say, hey, I want you to support, you know, House Bill 2832. Um, it's easier to say, oh, I'm going to look into that, you know, and, and for you to come back and say, we really need your support on this. When can we hear back from you after you've had a chance to thoroughly review this? You know, can you communicate back to us? You know, or, oh, I'm not on that committee is another one that we hear all the time. I can't do anything. I'm not on that committee. Well, you're our representative here. You can communicate to the chair and tell them how important this is to your constituents. You know, please send us a copy of that communication. You know, we, we, we want to make sure you've told them how important this is, you know, so I think there's a lot of those kind of things. I, I think Veronica was spot on in terms of the more specific you get on an ask, the more likely you are to get some of that pushback. Every once in a while, um, you know, Ben, you mentioned North Carolina, a certain certain representative from North Carolina that the kids could say the sky is blue. And I feel like she would say, no, nope, not so much blue this year. Um, it's a little more gray. Um, you know, there are some folks like that, and that's just the reality of, of how it goes. And so, again, you got to be flexible and professional. You will get to know them just like they're going to get to know you. And while this shouldn't be a partisan thing, certain people care about certain issues. You know, we have uh, Justin Amash in Michigan who's running for president now. I mean, he has his own world of issues when you meet with him that he cares about. And, you know, it's, it's a different lens than, than uh, somebody else, you know, is, is looking through. And you just, you get to know that and, and you'll build on that as, as time goes. But don't feel like we're getting, we're getting into details of an ask here. The ask, if you're brand new at this, is a, is a second or third or fourth step, not necessarily where you start. And, and I think Veronica was also spot on. I mean, some of the changes and big federal pieces of legislation that I've worked on, you know, take, take more than 10 years. I mean, imagine going and asking for the same damn thing for 10 years in a row. Like, could it be more frustrating than that? Like, not really. Like, it, there are definitely times when I question, like, why am I wasting my time? Like, is this advocacy having an effect or am I banging the head, my head against the wall? 
And I will tell you that even if it seems like you keep asking for the same thing over and over again, and at a state level, it's largely some sort of funding piece or maybe a policy piece in a piece of legislation, you keep asking for it over and over again, what you're doing is moving the conversation. So by the time it actually happens, it's sort of so obvious because you've met with so many people and pushed it to that place that you're likely going to get most of what you want or a lot of what you want, or at least the first step to what you want. And that that's hard to see, especially as a kid where maybe your lifespan on a, on a FRC team is four years, um, a little longer if you're an FTC as well. Um, but it, it's limited in that regard. And so you, sometimes you have to think a little bit bigger picture and realize that you know, you're moving the conversation a little more and a little more and a little more each time. And that comes with building the relationship and getting people used to those asks, providing even more data and more examples and more passion and more personal stories um, to, to load them up with ammo to advocate on your behalf. Awesome. Well, I, I love the specific examples you gave Mr. Heyer and also Ms. Veronica. I really like what you said about having like the relationship building maybe separate from the asks and really like making your schedule clear and keeping your purpose um, clear to your legislators. I think that was all a lot of really good information. Um, but kind of switching gears just a little bit, um, Mr. Heyer and Frank also, these, this is kind of for you now. So um, I had an incredible experience at the National Advocacy Conference last year, and it's actually um, what has inspired me to pursue STEM education advocacy as a career path. Um, so can you maybe share with our viewers what inspired you to form the formation of this uh, yearly conference on Capitol Hill? Sure. Thanks, Devin. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate all those folks who have come. If you haven't come, whether you care about advocacy or not, I would I would encourage you to come. I, it's an experience unlike any other. Where we're going to train you for a day and a half and send you up to meet with your elected officials, and you get to tell them whatever you want to tell them. We're gonna we're gonna encourage you to talk about first and and ask for maybe the specific things that are that are going on at that time. But it's your meeting to tell them what's important to you and your school district and your team and your world, your community. Um, to, to make your points. And it, and it really, if you can sit down in a senator's office and talk to a senator or, or a congresswoman, um, you know, you can talk to anybody. An interview is a piece of cake after that. Um, and, and that confidence boost, I think, is, is really a great takeaway. And while FIRST is all about getting people into STEM careers, we don't have enough people who know about science on the Hill. And it's great when we walk around and, and we usually do a reception at, at that event where we invite staff members and we bring some robots. And, and as we invite each office, you know, every year we hear more and more, oh, I used to be on a first team. And, and that's awesome to have staff members that are interning or they're, they're, they're um, uh, working in an office at this point, because the more folks that have that lens, the, the better we're going to be. You know, we used to have more doctors. We had a, a congressman from Michigan who you could meet with him about 22 seconds before he told you he was a rocket scientist. Um, he, he's since moved on. Um, but we definitely need more of that, that lens and that representation. And so the, the, more, the more students that can get engaged in advocacy and democracy and the process, the better. I mean, you, what you see on the news is not exactly what goes on there. Um, the more sort of firsthand actual sources you can get, the better. You know, so I think it's, it's a great experience. We, we started by bringing some students from my team to Washington. I, I was sitting in, I think it was Atlanta. They were announcing the chairman's award winner. And they said, you know, all oh, this team had done some advocacy work. They met with some folks in Washington. As a school board member, you know, I'd done a, a lot of that kind of stuff. I did some national PTA work with, with advocacy. And so I said to the kids, hey, do you guys want to go to Washington and, and do some meetings? You know, we we're trying to check a box to win the chairman's award. It was kind of that simple. Um, and we did. And I thought it was like the most boring two days we'd ever had because we had fairly boring, benign meetings. And, and the kids were like, when can we come back? And I was like, what is wrong with you kids? Like th this was like we we're half falling asleep because we had a really early flight and uh, they, they were all into it. And I think. And we came back the next year and came again. We started bringing kids from other teams. Um, we brought kids from a couple other teams and then five other teams. And we thought, all right, let's turn this into a formal conference back in, in 2014. And uh, the, really the, the, the huge 
benefit of it is engaging kids. And, and when they ask for something simple that should be obvious and, and it can't happen, you automatically get frustrated and engaged in the process. And if you come away wondering like why it's not obvious, why we should invest in, in our future, um, you're, you're getting it. And, and that's part of, the, uh, part of the experience and the process. And so obviously th this year we, we've had to go uh, virtual. Um, so I don't know when we're going to be able to meet in groups of more than like two people. Um, I don't know what your restrictions are exactly in Indiana, but you know, we have some interesting things going on here in Michigan. Uh, but we've gone virtual, so we're not able to meet in person. We don't even know what the, the uh, school travel plans are when nobody's in school and, and, and dealing with that. And so we've completely switched from a, an in-person specific ask meeting format to something that if you're a first timer, um, our virtual NAC or VNAC as we're calling it, um, the Virtual National Advocacy Conference is geared toward people who have done not as much advocacy and is really more focused on state level efforts. And so we cover a lot of the things we talked about um, in just the, the last uh, 45 minutes or so on this call, um, but we try to delve into things that you can do as a team and ways you can be prepared. And so we cover some very high level operations of the federal government, very high level things about how to do a meeting, how to conduct a meeting. And then the, we're gonna wrap up with some very specifics on how do you grab your elected official? And an elected official doesn't necessarily mean congressman or senator in Washington and, and state capital, but it could mean a school board member, it could mean a superintendent, um, it could mean um, you know, a county official, a township official, because um, advocacy really cuts through all of those pieces. And so um, uh, we're, we're doing a webinar format, it's free, you have to register. Um, for it. Other than that, um, we'd love to have you. We'll, we're having two different sessions. I'll let Frank tell you the, the dates and times and how to register here in a second. Uh, but it's a brand new format for us. We're going to try to make it as interactive and fun as possible. We've got some questions planned and we're fleshing out the content. We have some guests coming on. Um, so hopefully it's, it's the next best thing from NAC, but we wanted to make it different from NAC. And that if you've been a NAC, you're still going to get some stuff out of it. If you've never been a NAC, it's a great foundation. Um, and hopefully, if you're interested at all in that, you could you could jump on with us. But there's a lot of ways to get involved in advocacy. The more local it is, the easier and the more accessible it is. So if you want to advocate in your school district, you know your school board members. And uh, you know you, I was going to say you could bump into them at the grocery store, but you don't really go to the grocery store anymore. So the, the, the point is they're more locally accessible and in your community. I, Frank, before you jump in, I want to just split a plug in for NAC, um, just because I know we're getting short on time, um, but our advocacy at a federal level has been uh, everything from huge projects um, of authorization bills where we got for language beneficial to first to just annual appropriations. So in, in Congress, bills have to be passed every single year to fund the, the federal government. And NAC has come in uh, and been really helpful in terms of our advocacy campaign uh, campaigns to uh, get some of the first legislative asks accomplished. And I think just as a kind of a heads up, like this, I mean, we have everything from the Kristen McAuliffe coin bill, uh, which you guys, like we had thousands of teams calling their members of Congress, uh, more so than even attended NAC, um, and helped us pass a a bill that required two thirds majority in both houses of Congress and have it signed by the president. So that was super amazing. Uh, and so, but it can be something as big as that. Um, it can also be um, something such as, uh, I know we have a couple states that are getting state funding for FIRST. Um, in Texas, we actually just got uh, FIRST recognized as a varsity sport. Uh, that's kind of weird in a, in a, in a state where football is king, um, but we, we now can use their buses and we get funding for competition. So uh, advocacy looks so different in every single state, but you can accomplish small wins and you can accomplish the big stuff too. All right, I guess it's my turn. So this year we're holding VNAC, as Steve said, and it's going to be on June 13th and 20th from noon to four Eastern time. And as Steve said, we're going to have a variety of topics different on both days that are kind of different from NAC, but uh, kind of have the same underlying structure of like how to enter, engage with your congressman. And then just to follow up on uh, what I think makes the NAC experience so 
uh, influential is even if you don't plan on having a career in advocacy or anything political related, it really helps you be engaged in what's going on. And for students, that's extremely difficult to just figure out just by doing online research, because the more you go to the Hill, the more you kind of realize a lot of people don't know what's going on. So it's very hard to expect students to figure it out all on their own. And that's something that I think uh, NAC can do is it helps give you that foundation that if you're interested in, you can keep uh, building off of into some sort of career or at least allow you to be engaged in what's going on with your uh, elected officials. Yep, and that's uh, www.firstnac.org. If you're interested to register, or want more information about NAC, um, have any questions, our collective email address is staff at firstnac.org. If you want to ask anything or register, we'd love to have you. We appreciate being invited and uh, um, thanks for uh, uh, having us and doing this because I think it's kind of an intimidating subject and I think it's great to bring more people along in it. Well, I absolutely love NAC. I'm already registered for the virtual one, so I'm excited for it. Um, and I just think it's also really cool to give students a voice and really like let their story be heard when you're having this meet these meetings. And I just think that's really empowering, especially because like a lot of us, I mean, high schoolers aren't old enough to vote or anything like that, but still getting getting their voices heard is just really empowering and does help them be engaged, like you said, Frank. Um, but yes, so we are running short on time. So just to kind of start wrapping up, um, Ms. Veronica, I have one last question for you. Um, so what activities have you seen like ours that have been successful at getting in front of the governor um, and like legislature for their cause? What did they do? How did they go about it? Kind of like what was their strategy in getting their, maybe like a grant program passed or something like that? Yeah, I'm like trying to rack my brain. My the last eight years of my life are like drawing a blank. So I can't think of anything super specific, you know, like something like FFA comes to mind and that has a big, you know, national presence. And it's especially important for Indianapolis because they often host their national conference here. So they are like very visually present all the time. Um, but I think um, hopefully I've made it clear, like our legislature is very accessible. So I think, you know, reaching out to them and making the ask and building those relationships at your local level is going to be really, really important. Um, and then I would say, too, when it comes to making specific asks in terms of legislation, that having kind of a more centrally coordinated effort would be helpful because you don't want to have a disjointed message or there can almost be, you know, if you have a 100 of you saying different things and then the legislators get confused, well, who's the point person on this? Who do I contact? You know, if you don't have lobbyists, then it gets a little bit confusing for them. Um, so if you have maybe like a, I don't know if you guys have like a central committee or something like that, that could be helpful just to coordinate messaging and coordinate your approach and make sure you check all the boxes of kind of the lobbying um, process. And then I would also say, um, I think that this, you know, what you're, you're working on, um, you know, the state for the last several years has been very, very interested in STEM, um, and workforce development in your organization really goes to supporting those things. So everyone's going to be interested in that conversation. And I think you should also, engage, don't be afraid to engage the executive branch in that. Um, it can be a little more tricky there to figure out who to contact. Um, but for example, like you could invite the governor to an event, like don't invite him to all your events, but pick one, make the ask, um, and maybe he'll come. Um, you can request a meeting or if you have and I think having an advocacy day at the state house during session is really a great idea. And I would do it earlier during the session. Um, you know, you could invite the governor to that and maybe certain members of his staff and, or have a meeting um, with him on that day. So there are different, there are different options there, but I think that, you know, everyone's gonna be generally supportive of your organization and, and what you're doing. And I, I, Paul, I know we're running really short on time. Uh, Chris, I, I, I want to give one quick plug. Um, we do have one bill that we just, and actually speaking to Veronica's point about kind of a central messaging, um, we actually had a team in Illinois, uh, team 2338, um, that worked with their member of Congress, uh, Bill Foster, um, to introduce a resolution uh, creating a National First Robotics Day. And um, it was actually a complete surprise to us, but we were really excited about it. We were able to make some changes to it. 
um, just to kind of bring it kind of in line uh, with some of our kind of federal priorities. So uh, we now have HRES, so H-R-E-S, uh, and the number is 942. It would create a National First Robotics Day, uh, which would be the third Friday in March. And um, it also, and kind of to our kind of priorities, uh, has some language in there directing states that they should, encouraging states to, to use their funds that they have for K through 12 education for programs like FIRST Robotics. So this is kind of a building block for us, um, but kind of like the coin bill, we are really excited about it. Um, and we hope we can get it past this Congress in the last uh, six months that we have. Um, but again, it's HRES 942. So if you're reaching out to any of your federal elected officials, we love co-sponsors. So um, please, please uh, um, ask your members uh, to join us. Thank you, Devin. Thank you so much for uh, leading this great conversation. Thank you to our guests for attending. Uh, we have been, uh, Steve and Frank, we've been plugging uh, NAC on our previous virtual conferences. Uh, I'm registered. I know Devin's registered. We'll have, uh, I think, our almost our entire student board uh, registered for uh, the two sessions, June 13th and June 20th. Uh, and we're looking forward to that. Veronica, thank you so much for being on to give us uh, kind of a little bit more of an Indiana perspective. Uh, I think sometimes the, like, the points you've gotten to the atmosphere, I think can be a little different at the state level. Um, I think there's still some common threads though, uh, you know, dressing appropriately and being professional and making appointments uh, and things like that. But it, um, I know accessibility, um, even as Steve said, the, the more local you get, uh, yeah, my, our school board member lives, uh, I can probably see his house right out through there. That's not creepy. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so it's the more locally you get, the more accessible. So thank you all for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we're, we're definitely going to um, be working hard here in Indiana. We did have a state house day. Uh, it was the second to the last day of session this year. Um, probably wasn't the most productive day, but we, we had some good, we had some good visits. We'll definitely be looking forward to having a first day at the state house uh, next year, uh, as long as we can still gather together, uh, maybe earlier in session. So uh, thank you all. And that kind of does it for uh, this evening. Uh, we'll be back on the Twitch uh, tomorrow um, from four to seven with some more great content. Uh, so thank you to all who've uh, participated today. Uh, we look forward to, um, seeing our first Lego League teams tomorrow. Uh, some of our, our champion uh, award-winning first Lego League teams are coming on to do some showcases for us tomorrow. Uh, so we've got some great, uh, great things to see. So thank you so much. Take care, stay safe, uh, and be healthy. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.